Hello, and welcome to the 15th annual When Words Meet Images Symposium. My name is Dr. Amy Mooney, and I have the honor and privilege of working with the students who are enrolled in our written thesis course for the spring of 2021, a capstone for the art history major at Columbia College Chicago. This showcase features the work of six students who will present original papers based on topics that they selected and researched throughout the spring semester, resulting in theses that will support their future applications to graduate programs and other professional opportunities. For this presentation, their charge was to hone those more extensive studies into cogent arguments that demonstrate the topic's relevancy through a case of through series of case studies. Using formal analysis, contextual history, and a theoretical lens, their efforts reflect the critical and professional expectations in the fields of art history and visual culture. Our symposium is divided into three sections grouped around the themes exploring exhibitions and authenticity, gender, and phenomena and states of being. Each paper will be approximately 20 minutes long, and there will be a five minute Zoom break between each session. We invite audience members to pose questions to the panelists who will join us for a live session from 3.30 to 4 p.m. Afterwards, the faculty will meet to determine who will be this year's winner of the prestigious Hollis Siegler Manifest Award of the Golden Carousel, which recognizes a paper of extraordinary merit. We will toast all of the students in the Art and Art History virtual reception and announce the winner at 5 p.m. And you can access via the URL provided in the program. Please follow along in the program where you will find the students' biographies as well as their order of appearance. We would kindly like to thank the family, friends, faculty, and staff of Columbia College who have made this event possible. Special appreciation to Mimi Yu and the Media Center for the support of this event. Our first session considers the expectations and possibilities of museum exhibition and the concept of authenticity as posed by critical theorist Walter Benjamin. Angeline Leonard will present her paper titled What's at Stake in the Fake? An In-Depth Analysis of Institutional Art Reproduction. And it will be followed immediately by Jean Prigent and her inquiry titled The Contemporaneity of Contemporary Art Exhibition as Independent Art Form. Please join me in welcoming both students. In 2014, the Manners Museum in Virginia hosted an experiment under the guise of an art exhibition. Their new show was set to feature James E. Buttersworth, a titan in the field of marine art, but otherwise unknown to the general public. How did the institution convince the public to view the work of an artist no one had heard of before? In a daring effort, the Mariners Museum baited patrons with a forgery. Among 34 genuine Buttersworth paintings set one fake. They titled the exhibition, B is for Buttersworth, F is for Forgery, Solve a Maritime Mystery, and invited patrons to guess which painting they believed was a forgery. While a seemingly fun social experiment on the outside, it also questioned the eye and expectations of the public. The Manners Museum provided analyzed details of Buttersworth paintings to further aid the process, but would the average person have been as successful in their evaluation without those clues? Take right now, for instance. Did you notice any difference between these four images? Image number two happens to be a painting done by art forger Ken Perenni, who provided the forgery for this exhibition. This experimental approach led me to question, how knowledgeable is the public on reproduction and how does a copy affect the original artwork and the reputation of an artist? Ultimately, we may understand the benefits of reproduction, but what are the ramifications of the meaning and value of original works? In this presentation, I will debate the use of replicas from the viewpoint of a conservator, patron, and art historian. While I weigh the pros of reproduction, my focus will center on situ situational dilemmas when using replicas in and out of a museum. My intention is not to answer whether reproduction is right or wrong, but rather to question the ethical implications within its process and the potential devaluation of a work of art. I seek to challenge the way we think about reproduction and dispute the logic behind it. I will not answer every question I raise, but instead invite others to reflect on my queries and address their opinions on reproduction. This thesis will use examples from works on paper, 
Canvas, and Architecture. Note, for time purposes, some topics were shortened or excluded from this talk, such as the analysis of philosopher Mark Sagoff's writing and the destruction of the Buddha's Bamiyan. Before I debate the use of reproduction, one must develop a basic understanding of the mechanics behind replication. Professionals often use reproduction interchangeably with replica to describe a work of art that has been copied or recreated. While it may seem synonymous with forgery in the literal sense, one should think of an art forgery as a counterfeit. Within the art conservation field, a replica may also be referred to as a reconstruction, often used to describe three-dimensional works such as sculpture, objects, and architecture. A museum will engage with multiple forms of reproduction, for short-term use, a museum employs an exhibition copy or a facsimile, which replicates the image and not necessarily the original material. For works no longer fit to be exhibited, either for preservation concerns or the original no longer exists, a museum may choose to use a refabrication. Preservation presents the strongest argument in favor for reproduction. Sometimes it is not feasible to exhibit an item. They are extremely fragile even after treatment. For example, works on paper are highly sensitive to light. This light leads to the degradation of cellulose, yellow ink, and altercation of old ink, such as iron gall ink. Even if a museum mandated that all cameras have their flash off, natural and synthetic light remains a concern. Here it is an example of a work on paper riddled with damage. Entitled Westminster Palace by Felix Bew, this piece's yellow coloring is a, is a severe indication of light damage as well as clear signs of acidic burns and foxing. Work subject to similar damage would be best kept in a dark humidity controlled room. In order to contemplate replication, a museum must ask if the work is a proper candidate. Conservator Clara Rojas Sebesta of the Whitney Museum provides a valuable model of questioning for contemplating a reproduction. She asks questions like, why is a replication needed? What materials will be used? And what is the monetary cost? There are a number of people that may replicate a work, including the artist, the artist's assistant, the estate, an advisory board, a gallery, an enthusiast, a conservator, or a stage designer. Westminster Palace provides a clear example as to why we must consider who carries out the printing process. This print comes from the Met Museum, and the difference between these two images astounds me. Where is the depth and richness and pigment of the original? Our technology should optimize imagery to guarantee quality likeness that ensures an excellent viewing experience. Today, professionals employ a plethora of analysis techniques in the field, but I find it crucial to emphasize two means of reproduction, photography and 3D scanning, especially as scanning continues to revolutionize the way in which three-dimensional objects are recreated. In two-dimensional photography, Experts compile a series of high-resolution photos to recreate a graphic representation of a painting or drawing that can be copied and printed. If further analysis of a painting is needed, often determined by conservators during the condition report, photography can be used in conjunction with X-ray imaging, infrared reflectography, and UV lighting to better understand the various layers, age, and materials of a painting. With 3D scanning, or three-dimensional digitization, it cannot take the place of photography, but lends to a sharper understanding of 3D objects. This system provides a high-resolution 3D archive of the surface topography with accuracy of surface geometry, texture, color, and volume. From this data, professionals can create an exact replica without ruining the structural integrity of the original object. In some cases, they employ a stereolithography apparatus, which uses polymerization of photocurable resins to produce a part. Polymerization, in its most basic definition, is the formation of single molecules called monomers into polymers, long chains of monomers. A replica is built from the bottom up in a vat of acrylic or epoxy resin. In other situations, an exact mold can be made from the scan as well. Within the process of reproduction, a curator controls the presentation of an object in an exhibition. When considering the dilemmas in exhibition labeling, I will return to my earlier statement concerning the relationship between forgery and replication with an example from Noah Charney, art historian. Quietly examining young hair by Albert Dewar at the Albertina Museum in Vienna, Charney sensed something off about the work and quickly surmised it might be a reproduction, though did not presume to say so. However, it led him to question the Albertina's methods of documentation. 
The opportunist informed him that there are two notices printed on plaques to warn of reproductions in one of their staterooms. One plaque begins by stating, quote, In order to protect highly sensitive original works from exposure to light, some of the most famous icons of the Albertina collection of drawings are shown as facsimiles. End quote. This statement possesses a problematic lack of information. What is meant by some? Exactly which works are fake? If the Albertina was ever questioned about their lack of transparency, unfortunately, their suboptimal label allows them to claim they notified the public. But isn't this lack of specificity deceiving the public? I believe so. Unless you were a connoisseur of printmaking, would you be able to tell which were prints? By omitting valuable information, the Albertina leaves a large window for people to be fooled into interpreting the works as original when they are not. I argue that by conveniently excluding information, a museum becomes a proprietor of forgery. One may argue that forgery must be made with the intent to defraud someone, which a museum does not outright do, but a forger creates with the intent to deceive a buyer into believing a work is real. By labeling a reproduction with the artist's name and not as a copy, a museum tricks the public into believing it is real, therefore duping them just as a forgery. In this regard, the Albertina ethically falls short. In that same vein, we must consider how museums word individual labels. As an example, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture possesses a photograph of panel number one from the migration series done by Jacob Lawrence. Its initial label used the term Bridgman Images Bridgman refers to an art licensing and copyright clearinghouse, thus indicating the image was a licensed photograph of the original work. Unless the viewer was knowledgeable about Bridgman, how were they to know the work was a reproduction? At the time, the Smithsonian felt the label gave accurate information, but in 2019, they chose to alter the label to explicitly state reproduction. The lack of full transparency is disconcerting. A museum should not assume something as vague as Bridgman images is a viable notice of reproduction. Again, it leaves room for people to be, interpret this work as authentic when it is not. I propose there should be standards and documentation of reproductions worldwide. I believe if a museum is to employ a reproduction, a label must be clear and concise with simple and universal terms. Flexibility in terminology has the ability to lead to confusion and misinterpretation as seen in this case study. The presence of a reproduction in an art exhibition led me to analyze the confounding logic in using reproductions as an artistic substitute. In an article by Margaret Iverson published through the Tate Papers, she suggests, quote, some have greeted technical reproduction as a final deliverance of art from outmoded notions of authorship, originality, and uniqueness, end quote. But are authorship and originality truly outdated, and should they be? I answer no to both. For if authorship were truly a lesser concern for museums, any discovery of a fake unknowingly hanging on a museum wall would not be taken down in haste. Nor would forgery be so frowned upon. If a forgery sits on a wall of a museum, having fooled experts in many fields, one can only assume the image bears an eerie resemblance to the original, and yet forgeries are quickly discarded once discovered. Collectors and dealers scramble after authentic works and pay top dollar, fully trusting that the attributed artist's name is truly a Rembrandt or a Monet or a Degas. If two identical painted vases of flowers were presented, people would little care for the forgery in the face of a true Monet. So it was never about the image. It was about the name, the artist. I ask this. If the artist and authenticity are often valued above the image itself, why do museums purposely use reproductions? To support my previous question, there is little doubt reproductions provide documentation and learning experiences. Museums facilitate the growth of the public's knowledge. Art museums create spaces of learning. And in the way we use art today, in bringing attention to important issues such as feminism, mental health, politics, class, and race, they can open dialogues about our social climate. At minimum, they offer an aesthetic experience. And for those who cannot view the original piece, reproductions in other museums allow access. But most people probably go to a museum fully intending to see the original work. After all, isn't that the point of going? Why else would thousands of people cram around Mona Lisa every year? Patrons and critics would be aghast if the Louvre replaced the Mona Lisa with a reproduction. 
because we value the tangible work an artist over print. Otherwise, what is the difference in looking at a photographic print on a museum wall versus looking at a photograph on your device's screen? If you can find the photograph online, why go to the museum at all? I would be remiss to say it is not disappointing to see the reflections of someone's skill and hard work stripped to a flat photograph. An original piece holds history and time in such a physical way that can't be replicated in a photograph. As theorist and art critic Walter Benjamin once said, quote, even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element, its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be, end quote. He likens his presence to a physical aura felt when viewing a piece of art. Some argue that a good reproduction can replicate the aura, but I, to some extent, agree with Benjamin. With a replica, the artistic skill and physical history cease to exist. A photograph does not properly reflect the materiality of an artist's hand, nor does it possess the age and life of the original. As Mark Sagoff, a professor of philosophy who wrote the article on restoring and reproducing art once said, quote, you cannot appreciate a forgery by pretending it is a masterpiece. A painting is to be respected for what it is, the creation of a particular artist working at a certain place and time, end quote. I would like to see the effort of the artist respected above that of the image, to be humbled by the presence of true craftsmanship and not an imitation. Why has the artist's touch become obsolete in reproduction, but mandatory in monetary value? What happens to a work when we ignore the aura? That might best be answered outside the confines of a museum, as architecture often holds significant historical and cultural value. Here we ask, how does a reproduction affect the devaluation of the original work? Let's turn our attention to the Freien Kirche Dresden, a church located in Dresden, Germany. Originally built in the 11th century, it was meant to convert the surrounding Sorbian villages to Christianity. It continued to grow and morph over the years, eventually becoming a burial church, but due to its conditions, the church was condemned and the city of Dresden hired George Barr to construct a new building in its place in 1722. The dome stood for over 200 years until its destruction in 1945 during the bombing of Dresden in World War II. While it survived the initial bombing, Temperatures inside reached 1,000 degrees Celsius and the infrastructure soon collapsed. Most of the ruins remained in place for 48 years until Dresden City Council unanimously voted to reconstruct the building. The initial analysis was a painstakingly detailed process where various professionals conducted a stone-by-stone -stone investigation and used the original blueprints in IBM software to virtually reconstruct the fragments. When possible, Fragments of the Frank Kirsha were used in the original positions. The dark bricks seen in this image are the remaining fragments, and the building was completed in 2005. During its reconstruction, many professionals, Dresdeners, and people worldwide gave their time and money to see this project through. It resuscitated the community of Dresden, and I imagine it bridged gaps between generations amongst those who lived to see its destruction and those who wished to see it standing for the first time. Can we claim a reproduction is wrong when the community rallied for it? In fact, over 60,000 people attended on site for the reconsecration of the church. Furthermore, the reconstruction revived religious value as if Ryan Kirsha once stood as a center for the Protestant faith. Today, its reconsecration as a Lutheran church ensures a place of worship for those visiting or residing in Dresden. Nevertheless, the ruins themselves held historical significance and acted as a physical reminder of the 30,000 souls lost during the bombing. They became a bargaining chip in the German Democratic Republic's ideological battle with the West, and on February 13, 1982, became a symbol of the peace movement in Eastern Germany and a place for nonviolent protests. People gathered with candles to commemorate the dead, and today they perform the tradition in front of the Fine Kirsha. The intent and message may be the same, but I argue that removing the ruins erased part of Germany's violent past. The remains came to mean something in the face of war and peace. The reconstructed church does not hold the same history or weight as the harrowing bomb remains of the original, and therefore cannot carry the same physical depiction of destruction and loss. As for the historical value of the original church, that too was lost. James Janowski, professor of philosophy, recognizes that in 50 years or so, 
There will be no visual distinction from original and non-original material, conservators and instruments aside. Quote, indeed, the meaning and value in the import of history currently exemplified in the darker stones is a tangible reminder of the dark days in 1945 will no longer be readily accessible, end quote. Eventually, the stones will read as one unified building as though synchronously touched by age. While it will always be documented, the stones won't convey the bombing or reconstruction. However, I believe it goes beyond the future distinction between original and new. I believe it starts now. The dynamics of this case study reflect Walter Benjamin's thoughts on time and space. The reconstruction of the Frank Kirsha does not exist within the same time as the original and therefore does not possess the same aura or history. The spiritual footprints of the past, the craftsmanship, and the age were erased. In its last 16 years of existence, the new Frank Kirsha gained its own value, purpose, and traditions. Some may argue that by enacting an exact replica, the reconstruction immediately takes the place of the old church, but I claim the historical value and purpose is lost, and that of the ruins as well. No one can refute the advantages of art reproduction. It allows for documentation, exposure, accessibility, education, and conservation. It extends the lifetime of a work by preserving the condition of the original or creating an image of a work destroyed by age, the elements, or human hands. Multiples grant access worldwide and offer public exposure to artists and their works. Reproduction revives objects of cultural significance, therefore creating a new life in order to be respected through generations. And yet, no system is ever perfect. We should not become complacent in our ways just because it satisfies a single perspective. How can the use of reproductions be bettered for future exhibitions? What kind of universal language is best suited for labeling? We must be critical of the decisions we make and understand how they are read from differing standpoints. We inherently lose values in quality, historical significance, artistic hand and age when we participate in reproduction. How does one combat that cost? I want people to question the motives behind reproduction. As Anne Temkin from the Tate paper says, quote, it often seems we are dedicated to preserving something larger than individual works of art. We are dedicated to preserving the fiction that works of art are fixed and immortal, end quote. Must we always hold on tightly to objects and insist on their revival? Or should we accept that with time comes age, deterioration, and inevitably destruction? We may fight to keep objects present, but nothing lasts forever. Should we accept the end of their lifetime? Or do we aid in the destruction of cultural heritage by not reconstructing? Thank you. When someone says, I'm going to see an art exhibition, there's a huge possibility for the listener interpreted as he or she is going to see the artworks that are displayed in that exhibition instead of the exhibition itself. In fact, people believe that there is nothing to see in that exhibition except for the artworks, since normally it is only a space with white walls. It is true that this is what most of the art exhibitions in museums are like. They are neither expressive nor interactive. Visitors stand in front of their artwork for a while and walk to another one. The visiting experience is thus monotonous. However, the situation is very different in contemporary art exhibitions. What identifies a contemporary art exhibition is not the artworks displayed or whether it is held in contemporary time or space, but the methodology that informs the exhibition design. The word contemporary in this essay is an indication of innovative practice in exhibiting rather than happening in the present. To be sure, many art exhibitions curated today rely on traditional methods of display that do not counter or contradict expectations. Visitors expect to see and stand in front of original works of art, perhaps read some contextual labels and complete a survey, but rarely do they experience the exhibition as a work of art itself. I will challenge the fixed idea of the traditional art exhibition, highlighting contemporary practices that offer so much more. A number of contemporary art exhibitions refuse to simply be a space for perfunctory display and instead seek to offer viewers a far more sophisticated artistic activity. Those exhibitions tend to be more intense in extending the meaning of the exhibits or even shadowing them with an extraordinary design of the exhibition space through which the curator presents its sought on art and the audiences visit the exhibition in an immersive environment. Compared to the traditional, contemporary art exhibitions are spatially distinctive, artistically expressive, and interactive. 
I will trace the rupture between the conventionality and the contemporaneity idea of art exhibition by first briefly introduce the traditional method that has been used by exhibition designers based on some of the preceding study on this subject. Then I will provide two case studies of contemporary art exhibition. The first papers of surrealism curated by Marcel Duchamp in 1942 and Tui Transfiguration, a contemporary Chinese site-specific exhibition curated by Wu Hong in 2003 by formally describing, characteristically and ideologically analyzing the selected exhibitions. The second step of my investigation leads me to define certain general subfields for contemporary art exhibition and propose a model for interpreting this kind of ex contemporary exhibition as an independent art form. In 1976, the cultural critique of Ryan O'Doherty Introduced in his series of essays, the concept of Y cube, which referred to a certain gallery aesthetic characterized by a square or oblong shape, white walls and the light source usually from the ceiling. The initial sign of this mode of exhibition design's evolution took place during the mid 1800s. Museums and galleries in Europe started to make adjustments to their old way of discipline and automatically and naturally formed the approach derived from the arrangement model of private collections and Paris salons. The private collection and salon style disappearing means to have one work on top of the other densely from the floor to the city. This could easily lead to the gathering of a huge crowd of people and tiredness of the audiences because of need of kneeling down and raising their neck to see all the works. With a hundred years of persisting experiments made at different locations, changes were made including hanging the artworks at eye level, consideration of the color of the wall, and problems concerning the storage of artworks. In the 1930s, New York's Museum of Modern Art visited its first director, Alfred Barth, especially his Cubism and Abstract Art Exhibition, institutionalized and publicized the white cube that since then has become the predominant and prevailing exhibiting model. Art Institute of Chicago II by Thomas Schultz, created in 1990, is a part of his celebrated museum photograph series. The photos taken in the Art Institute of Chicago depicts a woman pushing a shoulder facing Gustav Kaobat Street, rainy day, where another woman raised the label. Schultz will contribute to the investigation of the act of living within the white cube context. The white cube provided an extremely neutral background for the artworks presented. The lack of ornamentation of the overall environment makes the artwork the only concentration of the audience. They were positioned in the space without any political or social context, and the act of viewing is mechanized. Here, our historian Marco Bosorti suggested the exhibition project is a necessary but purely accessory primitive structure, formally and communicatively silent and absent. Although the white cube is a default move for disciplining art, I believe that in some cases of contemporary art exhibitions, instead of insisting on functioning as something behind the scene for the works of art, they take part in contributing to the progress and development of art history, conveying the curator's viewpoint through a certain way of artistic expression and directly interacting with the audiences. Thus, they stimulate the freedom of art exhibition from fixed traditional concepts. During the World War II on October 14, 1942, a surrealistic art exhibition was held in the lavish ballroom of the White Law Red Mission at Madison Avenue at 15th Street in New York City. It was called First Papers of Surrealism and was the first major exhibition of surrealist art in the United States. Arriving in June of that year from Marcel, Marcel Duchamp reordered the whole gallery experience with the install installation recorded as his touring as the original title in the first papers of surrealism catalog. The art historian T.J. Demons described that the strain spanning the gallery in all directions without order or system, restricting visual access to the paintings, effectively dislocating objects from their visible exhibition and subjecting the gallery space to a stubborn and disorienting labyrinth of strength. The exhibition design was guided in a unique aesthetic logic, Marcel Duchamp did not randomly come up with the decision of buying some 60 miles of string and just solidly hand it all over the exhibition space for simple pursuit of creating an exaggerated force to attract attention. Instead of a thing for superficial sensationalism, string as an artistic element serves as a recurring motif in other Duchamp's works. For example, in Chocolate Render and Three Standard Stoppages, string appeared as a composition element. In this hidden noise, it works as a container. Those artworks were part of the data source on the integrity of the art object by the use of ready-made. Among the strategies of data, the use of ready-made is considered as one of the most iconic.
for the sculpture for traveling of 1918, Duchamp created it as an artwork composed of fragments of ready-made rubber shower caps cut up and glued back together as strands of varied lengths. He carried it with him when he left America in June 1918 for the neutral country in the World War I, Argentina. Duchamp explained that the format of the work was ad laptop, which he later expanded this idea to many other of his creations. T.J. Demis explained the symbolization of the ready-made in artistic practices. The ready-made then was already diversified as an artistic model during World War I. It became more than a structural critique of the author, object, and institution, stressing collapsibility, portability, and contextual determination. The ready-made established a relationship with geopolitical displacement. The miles of strain for the first papers of surrealism as ready made strain was a part of this practice. It developed out of an earlier data's concern for mobility and inclusiveness of the exhibition rating. The first papers of surrealism as an exhibition space alone is a creation able to represent a way of avant-garde. The exhibition space of the first papers of surrealism freed itself from a traditional facilitating role for the consumption of artworks. The exhibition design was spontaneous in conveying. Duchamp's strain, according to Damon's, acts against certain developments in East surrealism. At this point, Duchamp deconstructed the fixed idea on the exhibition. As one of the 20th century's pioneer artists who in the 1920s gave up painting and declared that he wanted to kill art, Duchamp made the exhibition he designed penetrated with the same idea. He overturned the central stage that the works of art for the first papers of surrealism will be the surrealist paintings has always been taken in an exhibition. Through the exhibition, he intended to state his own point of view on surrealism, and instead of supporting the artworks on display, it directly challenged the institutionalization of its surrealism. Without political party or popular support, Surrealist artists had gone through constant relocating of their strongholds, struggling through the world. However, the surrealism, despite of the reality of exile, produced a sense of a mythical homeliness, as Breton stated as a new direction of surrealism. By constructing the disorienting strain that works as a frame, Duchamp criticized this pursuit. Demons explained Duchamp's installation, in fact, forced the artists to experience their displacement status firsthand in the disorganized and disorganizing space of his installation and in the disorientation of their objects in that space. This in fact introduced a political framework to display of ours intent on escaping it. Duchamp disagreed with the willful ignorance of political consciousness and the disregard of the reality of displacement that would conflict with homely regression that the surrealists were going after. So he disrupted this fantasy by constructing the disorienting strains which take control of the overall exhibition space in order to emphasize the surrealism's geopolitical displacement in a nomadic age, despite of the surrealist's unwilling admission to, the re to this reality. Then how did he convey those thoughts to the public? The art historian David Hopkins described wealthy patrons and members of New York's cultural elites miled around attempting to make what they could of the strange babble net in which they were caught, peering through it to, to look at the paintings. The design of the males of string forced the audiences to react on it on the physical level and compulsorily drags their attention from their ex exhibits to the exhibition design. In fact, the more eager the viewers were to see the paintings, the more they will be influenced by the existence of the string as a barrier, the more they will bring their own participation into a visiting experience. Thus, the exhibition, instead of being expressive, was more performative. How Duchamp approached the audiences was also Dadaism, representing the notion of the interaction and confrontation in art with audiences. It provokes them, was aggressive to them, and shocked them. If Marcel Duchamp's first papers of surrealism is remarkable because of the creativity of the disorienting strings that redefine the space and even the artworks through which he endowed the exhibition with distinctiveness in space, aesthetic, and its relationship with the audiences, the Wu Hong's Tui transfiguration will prove to be an exquisite piece of art by the fact that it was also distinctive in all those aspects, but was achieved through the background story of its chosen location, Factory 798, and how this environment and the artworks had been brought together by Wu Hong into a coherent visual display. Tui transfiguration is a site specific exhibition curated by Wu Hong in Beijing's Factory 798 in September 2003. This displayed 12 series of photographs that Rong Rong and Yingli had created over the past 10 years. 
According to Wu Hong, site-specific exhibitions means to make use of various non-traditional exhibition space to have thematic exhibitions. Those exhibitions located in versatile, but non are specialist spaces. For example, bars, bookstores, supermarkets, etc., representing our street audience in a dynamic way. Due to the curator's elaborate planning, I believe Tui Transfiguration could serve as an excellent example of its kind. Tui Transfiguration took place in an abandoned factory shop in 798, originally a giant kiln lying in the middle of the space and was connected to the huge chimney at one end. The kiln had been destroyed before the exhibition, but the chimney still, still stood amidst the rusty machines and industrial waste. Other remains from the past included mouse words painted on the walls, broken windows hanging on the ceiling, and some freestanding buildings with boarded up windows. A row of two level houses stand opposite the chimney. Most of its rooms were filled with junk. Through this description of the exhibition space from Wu Hong, one can instantly relate it with the concept of rooms and historically symbolized the elements in the art tradition, which I believe, like the string as a ready-made frame to the first papers of surrealism, endorsed the 7 exhibition with its own unique aesthetic. During the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976, it is a period of stasis of wounds in art because the political environment repudiated any depiction of wounds as subject of aesthetic appreciation or social critique. Rune images resurfaced after 1979, the wounds of historical sites. For example, the Great Wall and Yuan Mingyuan are important elements in painting, sculpture, and literature. Artists they use them as representations of tragedy of the Trump culture revolution, resonated with the cruelty different individuals had experienced during the political movement on the one hand, but reflect the artist's confidence in a possible brighter future on the other. The 798 factory had existed for half a century when Wu Hong curated the exhibition there in 2003. It had gone through its birth as a busy industrial site to a gloomy room because of the city's deindustrialization in the 1990s. Silent and lifeless, they nevertheless felt familiar and close to heart. Here and there were traces of big character posters, painted revolutionary slogans on paving walls, and the dilapidated meeting house for political gatherings. For people of my generation, this was an image that brought back rich memories. Wu Hong described after he paid his first visit to the area in January 2002. Here, the 7 a factory to him is similar with the artist, who had also personally experienced the Cultural Revolution. They made reflections on wounds, evoking their memories of that chaotic environment in that period of time. Contemplating the exhibition space and the image of room, after interviewing the artist and analyzed their art, Wu Hong came up with a three-part structure textual analysis for the artworks. He started with Rong Rong's photographs of demolition sites that concentrate on the notions of ruination and death. Following by photographs that respond to the photograph figures in immediate urban environments representing the concept of transformation, since they convey a vague sense of happening, something begins to emerge from the rooms. So the beauty and use seemed collaborative works of the two artists demonstrating the concept of rebirth, and there was another group of cell portraits to relate the three parts into a dynamic whole. Wu Hong's classification of the artworks represent his personal interpretation of them. However, what is vital is that the gradual involvement from death to rebirth, from destruction to reconstruction, is narrated not only by the arrangement of the artworks, but also the transformation of the exhibition space, 798. The central concept that underlies both the photographic works and transformation of 798 that Wu Hong conceived is a temporal progression from death to rebirth. It is true that the exhibition space went through the same process. The place has transferred from the dead industrial facility into an art space after Wu Hong's curating. With his effort, the artworks in the exhibition and the site together demonstrate the poetic connotation of ruins as both a sign of recession and the possibility of revival. Wu Hong intended to create a transfiguration as an artistic space that could tell a story and interact with the audience. This was realized through his idea of transforming the three-part structure textual analysis to a spatial representation by restructuring the existing architectural space and constructing various architectonic frames with different materials. He was deeply aware of what texture can do for evoking feelings. For space one, which displayed the photographs of the demolition sites, 
The curator positioned it next to the entrance at one end of the factory shop. Instead of tidying up the space, he made effective use of the existing room setting where to a two-story building with its dilapidated walls and dusty interiors still remained. When visiting, the audiences were not only viewing the ruins in the photos, but also positioned in the reality of the ruination, where the shoes and clothes could become dusty. The concept of transformation was demonstrated in the central section of the factory shop, and the antique ground left by the begun kale as phase two of the exhibition, frosted glass. The architectural material used to make the large panels where on both sides of them the photographs were displayed, shimmering in the decaying factory shop with a thin greenish tint, symbolized a new life growing out of the baked soil, forming broad arches one leading to another, guiding the audiences forward along a spiral path. Space 3 features beauty and the used photographs. The curator believed that they marked the completion of rebirth. Here, a large gauze material curtain was used, separating the space for transformation and rebirth. By utilizing another material which in contrast with the hard industrial glass panels in the previous section, the soft, domestic material of the curtain evoked a sense of intimacy and attachment to life. With the accurate understanding and control of the particularities of the exhibition space and different material, the curator ingeniously enables the exhibition itself to tell a story through its own unique methods and enrich the audience visiting experience. Instead of plainly putting things together, contemporary art exhibitions is managed under a guide of an aesthetic principle in the curator's mind, which has made the exhibition project profound in an artistic manner. The curators refuse the exhibition to be the middleman between the exhibits and the audience. They intend to demonstrate their creative thinking on art through the exhibition, even fearless enough to stand against the, the artworks disciplining in some situations. Through the rearrangement of the space to stimulate the visitors physically or psychologically, the curators intensify the social communicative function of art exhibitions. Contemporary art exhibitions interact with the public directly. I believe that contemporary art exhibitions could be considered as a form of art, parallel to the position of painting, sculpture, photography, etc., through which the curators push forward in innovation in artistic expression historically. Thank you. Thank you, Angeline and Zhang, for your illuminating insights. Our next session considers the politics of gender in the genre of horror films with Sam Collins' presentation titled Transforming the Tropes, How Contemporary Feminist Filmmakers Are Changing the Horror Genre. Jenna Karecki will then follow with a presentation on Latinx performance art artists titled Abject Body Art, The Transmission of Trauma as a Contract of Intersectional Feminism. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. The widespread nature of sexual violence and harassment was broadcast publicly after Alyssa Milano's trending tweet in 2017. Activist Tarana Burke founded the Me Too movement in 2006. Suddenly, what began as a grassroots campaign was catapulted into the limelight. Hashtag Me Too revealed the expanse of sexual violence against women while advocating for the accountability of the abusers. Many of these allegations were brought against high profile men. Harvey Weinstein, a prolific film producer, had 100 cases brought against him. Since Weinstein's case became public, more than 200 men have lost their jobs due to public accusations. Many of these individuals worked in the film and entertainment industries. The media we consume is saturated with images of objectified and degraded women. From advertising, music, and film, women are represented as hypersexualized objects. This is especially prevalent throughout the horror genre. Although horror has more females on screen than any other film genre, these women are brutalized, assaulted, and raped. Over and over again, the horror viewer is consistently exposed to scenes where the defenseless victim is typically female and the perpetrator is distinctly male. Not to mention how the more sexually promiscuous females are among the first to be targeted and killed. How do these problematic depictions of gender affect audiences? What do they say about our societal values? I will be specifically looking at the work of Karen Walton and Jennifer Reeder as examples of how female authorship may be rectifying the representation of women in the horror genre. 
Throughout the late 1970s and early 80s, we experienced the golden age of slashers and the birth of the final girl. Horror theorist Carol J. Clover describes the slasher as the story of a psycho killer who slashes to death a string of mostly female victims one by one until he is subdued or killed, usually by the one girl who has survived. While we commonly see females representing the victims in gruesome crimes, the final girl is the sole survivor and the only character capable of defeating the perpetrator. According to Clover's analysis, she is portrayed as intelligent, competent, and most importantly, she is not promiscuous. She is typically the only female character developed in detail and is the first to suspect that things are not as they seem. The final girl is not fully feminine or masculine. To defeat the killer, she must obtain male attributes. Typically, the final girl uses the killer's weapon against them, whether that be a chainsaw or axe, which could be interpreted as a phallic symbol. Another prevalent cliche throughout the genre is death by sex. Women are valued for their sex appeal, but they are among the first to die as soon as they act on sexual desire. This subconsciously enforces shame in connection to expressions of female sexuality, while our culture simultaneously exploits women's bodies for pleasure. One of the most iconic final girls is Sally from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Directed by Toby Hooper, the slasher follows a group of friends as they travel through rural Texas. They find themselves being hunted and tormented by a local cannibalistic family. We watch Sally struggle to escape her attacker for nearly a third of the film. John Carpenter utilizes both the final girl and death by sex tropes in Halloween. Lori is not a stereotypical teenager. She happily spends Halloween babysitting, is the only one of her friends not obsessed with sex. Throughout the film, four murders occur as someone is on their way to have sex or just after sex. Lori's virginity allows her to take on her role as a final girl. Since she is not preoccupied with sex, she is more aware of the danger threatening their suburb. By the end, she fights back against Michael Myers with a clothes hanger. However, it is a man that ultimately saves her by shooting Myers. Although female characters are frequently hypersexualized in horror, they are immediately punished for expressing their sexuality. The females and occasionally males established as more promiscuous than the final girl counterpart are among the first to die. In many cases, these women are literally caught in the act by her perpetrator. Women in horror are used as a symbol of eroticism, but they are disposable regarding the film's actual plot. This active male and passive female role is outlined in Laurel Mulvey's seminal essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. Mulvey further argues that cinema is the ideal vessel for scopophilia, someone who finds pleasure in using another person as an object of sexual stimulation through sight. Women can be gazed upon with little agency. When considering the consistent narrative formula and tropes throughout the horror genre, it becomes expected to see females in the role of the victim. However, what impact does the male gaze have on viewers that continuously see females sexualized and dominated by men? Young women and girls internalize the notion that they are here to satisfy male pleasure. At the same time, men and young boys see the sexualized female body as something they are obliged to obtain. In an interview with Playboy, director Sam Peckinpah discusses his 1971 release, Straw Dogs. The film is highly criticized for its violent nature, but I find Peckinpah's discussion of women even more alarming. He describes his female character, Amy, as a young, uninformed, bitchy, hot-bodied little girl. Then, when discussing Amy's brutal rape, he says she asked for the rape, and there are two kinds of women, there are women, and then there's pussy. This director explicitly sends the message to audiences that if a woman looks or acts a certain way, then she's asking for it. According to a survey by PwC, horror films mainly attract an audience between the ages 18 and 24. This is precisely why we need female writers and directors. Feminist filmmakers are more likely to create representations of women that do not perpetuate harmful ideas. Although the horror genre often creates harmful representations of women, numerous examples defy this format, especially by female writers and directors. One example being John Fawcett's Ginger Snaps, a Canadian werewolf film which is structured around a strong sister relationship with an emphasis on female adolescence. The film is oftentimes self-aware, recognizing the socially constructed limitations of gender. 
Ginger Snaps not only fearlessly discusses female puberty, but also analyzes the double standard regarding female sexuality. Writer Karen Walton agreed to the project under the condition that she would be allowed to break all the rules, resulting in an untraditional werewolf movie. Although the horror genre is known for its use of tropes, it also utilizes various monsters that Barbara Creed dissects throughout her critical writing, The Monstrous Feminine, Film, Feminism, and Psychoanalysis. Much of feminist horror theory focuses on the problematic notion that women serve as victims. However, Creed's work analyzes the many ways in which women are represented as monsters. Creed determines that the female reproductive body is at the root of all that is monstrous and feared. Ginger's transformation into a werewolf is synonymous with her entering adulthood. The average menstrual cycle occurs every 28 days. The werewolf only strikes on the night of a full moon, resulting in a physical and psychological transformation. With the lunar cycle operating on a similar timeline, Crane determines that this intrinsically links the creature to menstruation. Suddenly, Ginger starts becoming more antagonistic and aggressive. Not only does she begin to grow hair in odd places among other werewolf features, but she also starts dressing in a manner that startles her sister. A few days after Ginger is attacked, she shows up to school wearing something exceptionally form-fitting, a stark contrast to her typical attire, gothic and oversized. In the traditional sense, women on screen are looked at and displayed with their appearance coded for strong visual and erotic impact. Utilizing a high angle shot as Ginger enters, she looks vulnerable and is visibly nervous. However, the camera then pans the length of the hall as she begins her descent. We see her discover a new sense of confidence as she struts down the hall. Although she does attract attention from her male classmates, she does not look overtly sexual. Her clothing is not especially revealing, but her newfound boldness draws their gaze. Ginger continues exploring her newfound identity, engaging in a relationship with Jason, a boy she initially had no interest in. Ginger takes ownership of her sexuality, which is especially evident throughout the scene where Ginger is hooking up with Jason in his car. Traditionally, this type of car scene results in the female modestly pushing away the aggressive male. However, Ginger is by no means submissive, as her assertive nature results in an attempt from Jason to reassert his dominance by saying, just lie back and relax. When she refuses, Jason responds, who is the guy here? Due to her werewolf transformation, she is physically stronger and overpowers him easily. She retains her dominant role through the end of the scene. Jason feels as though Ginger threatens his masculinity. This need to perform to one's gender is defined in Butler's text, Gender Trouble. Butler argues that gender is merely a construct of our society. These boundaries are ingrained in us from the moment we're born and significantly impact how we look, act, and think. The horror genre is especially prone to imposing specific roles on individuals by recycling the same harmful tropes. Ginger outlines these limitations in a conversation with Bridget later in the film. After the accidental death of Trina, the girls decide to bury her body in the backyard. Taking turns digging, Ginger says, no one ever thinks chicks do shit like this. Trust me, a girl can only be a slut, a bitch, a tease, or the virgin next door. We'll just coast on how the world works. Although this seems like humorous banter, Walton's writing acknowledges the limitations of female characters and film. To eliminate gender expectations, we need writers and directors to create characters that do not fit the traditional mold of their gender. Karen Walton infuses her own experience as a teenager throughout the film. When Walton was 14, she was implanted into a Canadian suburb much like Bailey Downs. Like Bridget and Ginger, who do not fit any typical high school clique, Walton felt like an outcast. By drawing from her own experiences as a young adolescent girl, Walton was able to subvert the traditional format for female characters in horror. She was adamant on incorporating commentary on menstruation, which can be a confusing experience for young women coming of age. Walton's care in developing a realistic representation of teen girls is evident. Both Ginger and Bridger are fully developed complex characters. Although Ginger is undergoing a physical transformation, Bridget discovers a new sense of autonomy throughout the film. As a younger sister, Bridget's identity seemed to be completely intertwined with Ginger's. However, as Ginger begins to change, Bridget is forced to discover her own identity and become separate from her sister. 
Ultimately, the film ends with Bridget making the difficult decision to choose herself over Ginger to survive. Unlike most female characters in the horror genre, Ginger and Bridget aren't there just to be gazed upon or to be victims of an enraged masculine figure. They are complex individuals with complicated relationships trying to navigate a difficult situation. Another horror film that authentically portrays the lives and experiences of young women is Jennifer Reeder's Knives and Skin. Following the disappearance of a local teenager, a Midwestern town deals with the aftermath. The horror elements are unmistakable, but the film defies classification by incorporating components from a variety of genres. Reader has a distinct visual style and utilizes clear feminist themes in a way that is unlike anything else in mainstream horror. The opening scene of Knives and Skin shows a knife-wielding mother investigating her teenage daughter's room after she has failed to come home. The scene is shot in hues of pink and blue, a striking use of color that Reader utilizes throughout the duration of the film. In classic horror fashion, the film continues as two teens drive through a wooded area for a secluded hookup location. After Carolyn decides she is no longer interested in Annie's advances, he pushes her to the ground and abandons her in the clearing. The mysterious disappearance of Carolyn propels the film forward. However, Reader does not necessarily stick to a linear narrative. The film follows Carolyn's peers and neighbors as they navigate their grief and loss. Through dress, Reader's love for the fantastical is also evident. With dramatic makeup and eccentric hair pieces, Reader gives each character their own distinct visual style. Unlike traditional horror, when the female characters are mere sexual objects, Reader defines her female characters' personalities and attitudes before they even speak. These differences are especially obvious through her distinctly different teenage characters. Charlotte Kirch has a gothic flair with her floor-length skirts and veil. However, she later declares her favorite color is actually pink. Reader makes feminist nods through Joanna Kitzmiller's fashion. The character adds iron-on lettering to most of her shirts. Some examples include Angela Davis and Joan of Arc. Through these subtleties, the layers of Reader's female characters are revealed. In a way, Reader has developed her own troops, which she incorporates throughout her many film projects. In an interview produced by the Criterion Channel, Reader informs viewers that they should think of them as visual or psychological tics that connect the films together. Some found throughout Knives and Skin include the use of the marching band uniform, a character with a wound that never heals, and objects that have an aura. This use of visual storytelling allows for Reader's arts background to shine through. Among all this, Reader drops feminist Easter eggs throughout her work. This can be seen in more subtle ways through a character reading something by an iconic female author or stated explicitly through dialogue. Not only are these ticks thought-provoking, they are also a refreshing take on the use of tropes throughout the horror genre. The film is based around the mysterious disappearance of Carolyn. However, her actual death is not seen on screen. As determined by Clover, the murders of women are typically filmed at a closer range, in more graphic detail, and at greater length. Reader instead takes a more artistic approach, interweaving scenes showing Carolyn's body in a more abstract way often using extreme close-ups and layering images to create a double exposure. After Carolyn's body is found, we discover that her cause of death was related to a heart condition, and it was determined to be an accident. In my interview with Jennifer Reeder, we discussed the significance of how she presented Carolyn's death. Reeder said, I wanted to make sure she wasn't a victim of sexual assault or murder. I didn't want to present an image or character that exploited what is constant real life violence against women. Reader was able to explore Carolyn's death without the use of graphic imagery. Carolyn also toggles the line between life and death as there are scenes where her seemingly dead body is singing. Even in death, Reader wanted Carolyn to have agency. Like Walton, Reader addresses ideas of toxic masculinity throughout Knives and Skin. Although Andy was in a seemingly committed relationship with Laurel, he had been pursuing a sexual relationship with Carolyn. Throughout the film, Laurel becomes increasingly dissatisfied with their relationship. She begins ignoring Andy's calls and texts, which results in a confrontation. Andy insists that she cannot break up with him because he has been on varsity for four years. Plus, he drives a Mustang. Laurel responds simply, you treat girls like shit. Andy then asks, why are you being such a bitch right now? 
Laurel utilizes the same language as Ginger, saying, I'm not a bitch, I'm not a slut, and I'm not a tease. You treat girls like shit. Andy asks for his jacket back as he begins to walk away. It's no surprise that we still see this language used nearly 20 years later. When we limit our on-screen characters to stereotypes, it will ultimately influence how we view ourselves and others. Reflecting on the impact of female authorship in horror, Ritter says, we have a relationship with blood from an early age. We learn to be afraid from an early age. We learn that we're prey at an early age. I think that we actually have a much more authentic stake in horror than men do. Not only are female filmmakers changing the representation of women on screen, but they may even be more intimately connected to the horror genre altogether. In Powers of Horror, an essay on abjection, Julia Kristeva defines abjection as a catalytic cycle of compulsion-repulsion that destabilizes systems, order, and identity. The abject, that which prompts abjection, embodies what must be rejected in order to survive. Reality erupts at these limits of primal repression where mortality infects humanity. As seen in Cindy Sherman's untitled number 190, the body becomes a reminder of its impending betrayal, reducing all of life to the same base level of biology. Encountering a corpse is the ultimate abjection, and the abject nature of bodily defilement traces back to death. As barriers dissolve and the inside meets the outside, self and subject merge with other and object, meaning collapses. Because the abject evokes a powerful experience that challenges dominant powers, it became a tool for artists concerned with human rights. Kristeva's theory gained popularity in the United States during the 1980s and 90s, as artists like Cindy Sherman defied bodily norms within a feminist framework, seen here addressing the misogynistic implications of the maternal body and mass media. Art critic and historian Hal Foster analyzes the abject as it connects to American contemporary art in the avant-garde, notably through Sherman's photography. In his essay, Obscene, Abject, Traumatic, Foster poses questions regarding the effectiveness of abject art as a subversion of the hegemony. Is abjection a refusal of power or its reinvention in a strange new guise, or is it somehow both of these events at once? Is the abject disruptive of subjective and social orders or foundational of them? A crisis in these orders or a confirmation? A point of contention within the abject is activism, is its dialectical opposition between I and other, which conflicts in a nihilistic space. If the abject presupposes an imbalance of power, an abjection is the inescapable reaction, does it become a regulatory process of othering? How can a state of meaninglessness provoke meaningful action? While Foster identifies critical ambiguities in Kristeva's theory, I argue alongside philosopher Judith Butler that, quote, the politicization of abjection via abject bodies does not have to be a reverse discourse which reinstates what it's attempting to overcome, end quote. In this essay, I will explore the possibilities and limitations of abject body art as an approach to activism that addresses the modalities of identity by referencing theories concerned with the implicating relationship between artist and viewer as mediated through trauma and photography. In the 1970s and 80s, there was a surge of Latin American women performing masochistically abject body art to subvert violent power structures, involving the audience in a transmission of trauma that serves as a contract of intersectional feminism. Maria Avelia Marmalejo and Leticia Parente performed the body in pain to reflect their understanding of the respective contemporary socio-political struggles in Colombia and Brazil. Artist Maria Avelia Marmalejo uses abjection to address political oppression and feminism. 
Marmalejo performs body art for the first time with Anonymo One, Anonymous One, 1981, at the Square of the Municipal Administrative Center in Cali, Colombia. As Marmalejo enters the room, police guard the audience from getting too close. Appearing anonymous, dressed in a white tunic and a cap with a bandaged face, she walks on a long white sheet of paper. Marmalejo sits and slices the bottom of her toes before standing up and walking, leaving a trail of blood behind her. Sitting again, she bandages her wounds, then continues to walk until the 20-minute duration ends. From the start of the performance, Marmalejo appears discernible as a human, but indistinct as a person. The lack of identity granted by her corpse-like attire abjects the injured other into I. The self becomes the body underneath medical dressing, now struggling to prolong the inevitability of death. When Marmalejo slices her foot and blood flows from the interior body to the exterior world, everything becomes unsanitary, infected by the visceral leakage of mortality. Bandages attempt to mend the defilement, but they quickly become a reminder of the wound underneath, collapsing the injured self into an object corpse. As Marmalejo walks on freshly cut skin, the state of agonizing abjection lingers. Throughout the performance, Marmalejo corrupts her body, which is inherently tied to the audience's perception of her identity. She manipulates what the viewer interprets as a womanly body, prone to patriarchal sexualization, into the abject. A sight of pleasure retches into disgust, inducing a cycle of compulsion and repulsion that solicits and questions the gaze. Disturbing identity and order, Marmalejo's masochistic actions assert autonomy against systems designed to regulate normative behaviors and bodies. The equalization of power through corporeal unity and structural subversion forces the viewer to confront their relationship with quote-unquote other. In Anonymous 1, Marmalejo is other represents those tortured and lost during the Torbe Ayala regime. Marmalejo performed Anonymous 1 while Julio Cesar Torbay Ayala was the 25th president of Colombia. During this time, the guerrilla movement M-19 emerged and intensified, culminating in a 1980 seizing of the Dominican Republic's embassy, where they held 12 ambassadors hostage for two months. Ayala managed a peaceful resolution that satisfied the public, but he soon retaliated with draconian measures. That same year, the London-based human rights organization Amnesty International accused Ayala's government of systematically torturing political prisoners in military stations. The report stated that, quote, political imprisonment that exists in Colombia has gone beyond the limits of countering violent opposition, and many of those arrested were exercising their human rights in a nonviolent way, end quote. Amnesty International also noted that, quote, peasants and rural Indians, end quote, often endured discrimination, arbitrary arrests, and assassination under military authority, often occurring in tribal areas. As stated by art historian Cecilia Fajardo Hill, Marmalejo performed Anonymous One as homage to those tortured and lost during the Torbe Ayala regime, in solidarity with their pain. By slicing her toes, Marmalejo acknowledges the systematic torture of political prisoners. She realizes healing is a deserved necessity by bandaging her foot, yet actualizes the painstaking endurance required by continuing to walk. Throughout the piece's duration, quote, the public, mostly male, was both disturbed and touched, though according to the artist, were more impressed by the blood in the performance than by the daily violence in Colombia, end quote. But why? Perhaps the direct engagement with abjection through another's embodied trauma fostered a sense of individual responsibility. While the audience's reception presents a potential limitation as the performance can eclipse its socio-political intention, the experience generates emotions and thoughts otherwise unprovoked. 
Questioning foundational power structures, abject body art can critically transform an individual's perception of the quote-unquote other and even elicit a desire to help. Because of Anonymous One, an audience largely complacent with the unchecked brutality occurring under Colombian power structures, stepped closer to the realization of action. Art theorist Jill Bennett conceptualizes trauma-related art as enabling activism through a transmission of trauma. Bennett describes the, quote, effective responses engendered by trauma-related artworks, end quote, as, quote, not born of emotional identification or sympathy, end quote. Instead, they resist the extrapolation of a subject and emerge from a direct engagement with sensation. Connecting Hal Foster's theorization on abject art to trauma studies, Bennett argues that, quote, visual art presents trauma as a political rather than a subjective phenomenon. It does not offer us a privileged view of the inner subject. Rather, by giving trauma extension in space or lived place, it invites an awareness of different modes of inhabitation, end quote. Transactive rather than communicative, it does not convey the quote-unquote meaning of trauma, but leads towards conceptual engagement through an interpersonal experience. In Anonymous One, Marmalejo directly engages a transmission of trauma through the sensation of abjection. She speaks from an inside perspective while on the outside, an other jettisoned into the space of I, confronting the living self with the mortal body. There is no meaning behind her physical trauma, but there is an ideological engagement formed through experience, one that challenges Ayala's government as a system of power. While this transmission originally occurred during Marmalejo's performance in a physical place, it transcends spatiotemporal limitations through photographic documentation. Photographer Fabio Orango documented Anonymous One with several chronological pictures. The extended spaces of trauma granted by these immaterial images exist solely between Marmalejo and a viewer, removed from the social environment of performance, without the influence of a fellow audience or police officers. Photographs can mediate the transmission of trauma, removing power structures from the equalized relationship between self and other, allowing for a freer state of political abjection. As theorist Ariella Azule explains, the viewing of a photograph which exists on the verge of catastrophe occurs in an ungoverned, quote, apparatus of power, end quote, that fosters a sense of duty towards the subject in disaster. This results in acts of reciprocal citizenship, governed persons utilizing, quote, their position for one another rather than for a sovereign, end quote. The civil contract of photography furthers the equalizing and implicating effects of abjection and trauma, suspending time and transcending place to isolate the negotiation of I and other. The body art of Leticia Parente abjects domestic and consumer imagery to confront issues of gender and socioeconomics. In a 10-minute black and white video titled Marsa Registrata, trademark 1975, Parente sews the phrase made in Brazil into her foot. Trademark begins with a slow panning shot of Parente's legs as she walks to a chair and sits. The camera moves to her hands threading a needle. After tying the knot, Parente's hands drop out of frame and the camera follows. She begins sewing the thread through the bottom of her forefoot, going over the stitches until they form clear connected letters. She finishes the word made, moves on to the arch of her foot, stitching in, and then onto her heel, stitching Brazil. As Parente repetitively pierces her foot, the seal between the inside and the outside is broken, exposing the frailty of human skin as a protective boundary. She threads a foreign object through a defiled body, infecting the vulnerable inside with the unclean outside and rendering the borders indefinitely open. These passages are further contaminated when Parente visibly struggles to get the needle through her foot, 
or has to re-stitch through already pierced skin to define a letter. The dissolution of barriers between the inside and the outside reduces I and other to the same biological mortality, confusing the conscious with the corporeal. Trademark generalizes the body as subject, while intensifying its position as an object to be sewn, emphasized by its zoomed-in compositions that resist identification. Parente's fragmented body, an other abjected into the place of I, becomes the site for an equalizing interpersonal experience that undermines systems of power. Parente created Trademark in the 1970s during Brazil's second wave of feminism, coinciding with the Fifth Brazilian Republic's military dictatorship. Many Brazilian activists during this time disavowed the feminist label because of its association with bourgeois and imperialist American politics. Instead, they grounded their practices in leftist Marxism. By the 1970s, women activists began to acknowledge gender as an equal issue to class and capitalism, although race remained largely unaddressed. Brazil's dominant ideology, entrenched in gender roles, perpetuates expectations of domestic housework and child rearing, alongside the Maranismo, a cult of motherhood associated with the Virgin Mary. In trademark, Parente challenges the hegemony through a socio-politically coded violence. Considered a feminine domestic act, sewing provided the means for Parente to abject and decontextualize the understanding of quote-unquote womanhood. Parente objectifies her own body, asserting control over its pleasurable appeal through disgust. A thread in needle transformed from sites of domesticity into a reminder of universal desecration. The title, Trademark, references the governed protection of commercial assets and contextualizes Parente's choice to sow the phrase, made in Brazil. Addressing capitalist and patriarchal structures, self-branding posits the body as controlled by a veiled omnipotence of power. Parente stitches her own foot into a commodified object, a branded shoe ready to be sold and distributed manipulated by nationalist capitalism and American imperialism. She abjects cultural signs that represent an assimilation to normative structures, repulsing the irresistible pleasures of consumerism. Fixed identity collapses, revealed as a construction. Parente's agency, asserted through self-infliction, confuses the oppressed with the oppressor and questions the viewer's role in perpetuating systems of power. As the audience engages with trademark, abjection catalyzes a socio-politically driven transmission of trauma. Meaning does not come from an understanding of Parente's identity or actions, as she obscures the subject body into an unthinkable object. Instead, her intense embodiment of trauma abjectly merges I with other, eliciting a realization of different lived experiences. Parente never performed trademark live, Therefore, the transmission of trauma exclusively occurs in a space mediated by the civil contract of photography. The camera's apparatus of power, as defined by Azoulay, allows for an interpersonal relationship between Parente and the viewer without interference from Brazilian power structures or American imperialism. Because Parente filmed Trademark indoors and without an audience, she could perform without fear of intervention from authorities. Similarly, the viewer can experience Parente's radical performance in an apparatus outside of governing powers that can influence its reception. Trademark modifies, quote, the way in which individuals are governed and the extent of their participation in the forms of governance, end quote, allowing the transmission of trauma to occur regardless of time or location and recontextualize power structures without interference. By injuring their own feet, 
Maria Avelia Marmalejo and Leticia Parente actualize the reality of lived pain, forcing the audience to confront different modes of existence. They impair their own mobility to reassert autonomy against controlling power structures, recognizing victims of socio-political violence and destabilizing conceptions of foundational systems. As Marmalejo and Parente decide to stand on their wounds, they worsen the pain in defiance. Realizing the strength and endurance needed to move under oppressive systems, embodying trauma, they equalize the I and the other, abjecting the viewer into a realization of complacency and a larger consideration of ideological positioning. Viewed through documentation, Anonymous One and Trademark create a sense of shared vulnerability and contractual citizenship that can engender community action, removed from the inherently hierarchical systems of governing and extended to those who may have remained complacent or adversarial. Abject body art possesses the ability to resensitize the self, fostering empathy and generating action. In an information era bombarded by horrific news stories made into a spectacle by mass media, our responses to trauma run the risk of desensitization. Lived agony becomes lifeless words on a screen or images shown briefly as news anchors drone story after story. This constant barrage creates a culture of complacency that perpetuates systems of power and dehumanizes their victims of violence. Repeated exposure to this unavoidable media can normalize or sublimate issues that require active attention, not passive looking. Abject body art, as seen through the work of Maria Avelia Marmalejo and Leticia Parente, has the potential to trigger an effective response that can actualize a movement towards true acknowledgement and subsequent change. Thank you, Sam and Jenna, for your insightful considerations. Our next and final session considers the experience of the phenomena of color and states of being. First, we will hear from Ohu Koilat on Revolution Red, the emergence of color as ideological identity. And our last speaker, Eif, will present their work on the necessity of boredom in a paper titled Queering Commodities Through Ennui, or How Capitalism is Resistant Through the Works of Endurance and Boredom by Queer Artists. Please be sure to join us after the last presentation at 3.30 so that we can congratulate all of the students for their excellent work and pose any questions that you may have. We will then reconvene for the Art and Art History virtual reception to toast the students and award the Hollis Secret Manifest of Prize. Thank you. The color of passion, power, and prestige, red has commanded the attention of artists for centuries. From the Paleolithic period to the contemporary, this archetypal color has been utilized by artists to visualize the extremes of human experience. Red is the color of blood, uprising, beginnings, and endings. As the first true color humans perceive after black and white, it is still known as the hue that humans first mastered, fabricated, and reproduced. It is the color that dominated visual culture for many centuries and inspired artists' imaginations. Its symbolism, though culturally specific, is universally employed, and its multipurpose can become an intersectional point where different time periods and cultures converge to bring compelling narratives. Just as language is determined by how society sets up systems of values, ideas, and things, our chromatic perception is determined by experiences. In everyday life, the reaction to color demonstrates a sort of inner and profound solidarity between the semiotic nature of culture. The powerful symbolism of it has been universally employed by many cultures to use it for social and political purposes. Beginning in the late 18th century, the symbolism of red was charged with a new meaning that would supplant all others over the course of several decades, political red. This red became a universal language that conjoined all the different ideologies together to be utilized as a tool for revolution. Emerging from the French Revolution, political red came of age in the social struggles of 19th century Europe and took on an international dimension to the point of representing zealots and zealots. From French revolutionaries and their red Phrygian caps, 
the Bolsheviks and their Red Star, and Chinese Cultural Revolution and the Little Red Book. In many areas, the word red became a kind of synonym for adjectives like socialist, communist, extremist, and revolutionary. In an attempt to further discuss this phenomenon, case studies from the 1920s Soviet Union, 1960s America, and 1990s contemporary Chinese art will be examined. The link between red and politics dominates the history of this chroma for more than one and a half centuries, emphasizing its symbolic fields with passion, power, and justice. World leaders have used red clothing as a way of showcasing their power to send an unequivocal message of their political and moral strength. After the fall of the French monarchy, the hue gets taken up by revolutionaries around the world to symbolize new liberties and freedoms. After World War I, the ideological use of red becomes closely tied with the propaganda of a new political system. Red becomes a central feature of the political arena, is used in campaigns, and becomes culturally associated with movements' ideologies. It is society that assigns value to the color, giving it its vocabulary and its definitions, that constructs its codes and values, that organizes its uses and determines its stakes. Color is essentially an interdocumentary and interdisciplinary phenomena that explores not just the human psyche, but also a variety of different perspectives that are reformed throughout history. Individuals and communities are shaped by their culture and societal stimuli such as events that happen in their lifetime, therefore recognizing themselves as subjects of an ideology. Every pattern of thought, every philosophical or cultural product belongs to a specific societal group in which it originated. These patterns of thought are defined as ideologies. Ideological debate has influenced politics as well as art during the 20th century in ways that are different from previous times. In a seminal text on ideology, Structuralist Marxist theorist Louis Althusser states, all ideology hails or interpolates concrete individuals as concrete subjects. He argues that the term idea disappears and consciousness, beliefs, subjects, and actions survive in order to create rituals, practices, and ideological apparatuses. The ideological state apparatuses like family, religion, institution, educational system, and media give us an identity. It is truth that through this identity that we recognize each other. Althusserus goes on to state that ideology has a material existence that manifests itself through actions that are inserted into practices. In order to inaugurate this in the case of politics, red proves itself to be an agent of creating unity, a connection between the psychological collusion of opinion between transmitter and receiver and an informational device. More specifically, it is used not just to complement meaning, but also operate as part of a whole assemblage of effect, emotion, and signification. In Althusser's terms, red presents itself as a sign, an object, or concrete image which provokes an idea, a notion, or feeling that interprets the conceptualization of people. Although its use in the political realm has received limited attention, red contributes in a fundamental way to the construction of identities and brands in a political context. Its use is widespread, have practical purposes, form and reinforce solidarities, and acquire meaning. Upon this shift in symbolism, Red strongly emerges as a notable color of interpolation. Most famously, the USSR socialist movement consistently starts adopting the hue for metaphorical reasons. In the 20th century, communism arises as escalated tensions result in the Cold War. The Russian Revolution takes place in 1917 as the country is freeing itself from the grips of the ruling elite. The desire is to revolutionize all aspects of Russia. Artists become a part of a mechanism that should protect and enforce a specific political condition or aim, guiding people towards a specific ideology. The Russian avant-garde looks upon the revolution not simply as a political event, but as a new era in the reconstruction of culture and life in pure color and form. This modernist evolution influences a new art movement named suprematism, which is founded by the artist Kazimir Malevich. In the early 1920s, the art movement known as constructivism borrows the geometric forms, strong colors, and dynamic composition of suprematism. Constructivist artworks are part of a greater visual program to awaken the masses and lead them towards awareness of class divisions, social inequalities, and revolution. They think that art should reflect the industrial world and that it should be used as a tool in the communist revolution. Red embraces an identity that represents a revolutionary patrimony for many communists, signifying the blood of the workers and a call to action. 
It gravitates to become a symbol for the movement and global revolution. From paintings to posters to textiles, artists create a visual language out of forms and color. The production of posters has not yet fallen under a centralized direction, and a great variety of artists are drawn to poster production. Some are established artists like Al Lizitsky. According to Al Lizitsky, art before 1917 was old-fashioned, so he seeks to merge art and life through mass production and industry. His poster titled Beat the Lights with the Red Wedge is futuristic, contains new tools, a new style, and is all about moving forward. The main goal of this piece is to spring Russia into the future. The poster highlights the ties between culture and revolutionary ideology, all the while showcasing the evolution and creation of a distinct graphic style. He uses his signature coded color combination of red, white, and black, which reinforces the message indicated by the work's title. Lizitsky produces this politically charged work in support of the Red Army. The red wedge symbolizes the revolutionaries who are penetrating the anti-communist white army. Colors and shapes take on a directly symbolic significance. The few words are aligned with the diagonal trajectory of the red triangle as it pierces the white circle like a pin in a balloon, implicitly freeing it from the surrounding darkness. The red army has pierced the defenses of the white army. A smaller triangle and a circle repeat the same theme in the upper right, and throughout the design, small red rectangles dominate small dispersing white rectangles, symbolizing the Red Army's triumph over the White Russians. Beat the Whites with the Red Wedge liberates the viewer from the fixed position and lets the geometric elements and red be an abstract allegory of the revolution. Red becomes not only a symbol with meaning, but also as a force, an intensity, and an identity. Lizitsky's use of the chroma interpolates the viewer through the dynamic composition inspired by the freedom of revolutionary spirit. Based on Althusser's theory, built into this influence is a theoretical theme that political red opens new ways of seeing that go beyond the limitations of lived experience. The personal life and work of the artist transcends the individual and speaks meaningfully to a larger audience, bringing together the political and human functions of art. The important part in any consideration of art and interpolation is its historical trajectory and connectedness to different epochs. In 1960, the United States witnesses a decade of revolution of change, protests, mass consumption, and advertising. Advertising as a social system has its internal logic on the basis of which it operates. It appeals to people in such a way that it affects their choices. In advertising discourse, ideology functions as Althusser states through the interpolation of the viewers. There is a discourse of their inner voice used in advertisements that address the reader as you, continuously telling the person what it is they want and need. Advertising as an ideological practice interpolates individuals as subjects. By the mid-1960s, an art movement called pop art becomes a phenomenon where advertising, magazines, and popular culture have propelled a social revolution. The artist's retooling of known imagery plays on the expectation of the viewer, but then extrudes it further by the use of color, arrangement, placement, and the alteration of the definition of what is considered art. It is a new type of art that emerges as a social critic towards the rules of capitalism, questioning the density of images related to consumer culture. The work of Andy Warhol signals the coming of the consumer age and the development of a mass culture that both reflects and shapes contemporary life. Andy Warhol's Red Race Riot is a silk screen that employs a Life magazine image by photojournalist Charles Moore that documents police officers and dogs attacking a non-violent protester in Birmingham, Alabama. It was one of the epicenters of the civil rights movement, with the Birmingham campaign in 1963 led by Martin Luther King Jr. The silk screen represents social injustice, a theme not often explored by Warhol. His appropriation and inversion of the life photograph through political red drastically alters the meanings embedded within the image. In the early 1960s, life presents readers with the cliched images and illusions of post-war American life. Warhol applies a strategy of appropriation and inversion to life advertisements that precisely replicate the intervention he staged against the magazine's editorial content. By mimicking the use of the dynamic red in life advertisements, Warhol makes an ironic juxtaposition with the printed image of the riots. While life advertisements use colors to make their products exciting, here, the shocking visual discordance between subject and color shakes the viewer. 
The use of the silk screen and the deliberately messy registration of it makes the viewer feel unsettled, making it have an emotional impact. The seduction of repeated images, their balanced composition, and the archaic stillness of their riot transforms the tragic document into a sort of slapstick. The use of three screens in strict narrative sequence and repetition emphasizes the mini morality play. In Althusser's terms, this strategy represents the original photograph's indexical meaning and transforms it to fit the necessary conceptualization of the social formation. One frame alone would have been seen as an untidy happenstance, an accidental freezing of a moment in the news photograph's stock in trade. The final screen is cut and partly repeated. The effect is empathic, not disruptive. The repetition does not break the overall narrative flow. On the contrary, the story starts up again to finish on just the same. The red emphasizes the noise of the moment. It becomes fire as if the piece is burning from underneath. This represents a darker side of what one understands of the American dream which is a defining moment in the understanding of how publicity images could affect the way that the world reacted to moments in time. The color signifies blood to create an incredible reaction to the civil rights movement. The images that show America at war, cold war, inner war, segregation being one of the most powerful demonstrations of injustice in the country. This piece marks a turning point in the pop movement. From the beginning, there has been a polemical element in pop art, but it is one thing to poke fun at supermarkets and television commercials, and another to use art as means of confronting the viewer with the raw terror of so much that happens in the world. Red Race Riots demands the viewer to radically revisit the criteria for aesthetic appreciation, letting visual arts become an output for counterculture and radical politics. Through his choice of political red, Warhol succeeds in challenging the mood of the country. Going against the dominant norms of the time and traditional styles, Artists make radical changes in the approaches and techniques to communicate their ideas. Althusser's critique of the production of the individual subject under the guise of ruling ideology serves as means to reflect upon the historicized nature of aesthetic practice within contemporary China, as subjects prevailing ideological transformation of the reform era attempt to critique and represent contemporaneous social shifts. Shortly after the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949, Chairman Mao Zedong declares that art should serve the people. Until the mid-1960s, works of art serve the masses and do not criticize the state. Under enormous pressure from the guidelines of the Central Cultural Revolution Group, art is expected to foment revolution and be red, bright, and shining. Art becomes limited to propaganda and is used as a tool to spread the ideologies of the People's Republican Party. Mao adopts Soviet socialist realist idealized imagery to project himself as a prosperous leader of modernity and the revolution, and the chairman's portrait is converted into an icon and a symbol for revolution. In 1977, a year after the Cultural Revolution, universities and art academies open, and since the Republican period, the 1980s witnesses the emergence of numerous heterogeneous forms of artistic production. One of the foremost leitmotifs of Chinese artistic practice during this time is a critical rereading of the role of the Cultural Revolution in the construction of contemporary Chinese identity. The discursive properties of works of art are no longer bound to the official propagandistic guidelines of the previous era, and they evoke a postmodern nostalgia for the mass revolutionary past juxtaposed with the emergent forms of the present. Artists within this movement focus their creative energies on uncovering the ideological forms as promoted by the state. Within the midst of this fragmented and energetic artistic environment, political pop art emerges as one of the leading trends in contemporary Chinese art. Artists are particularly inspired by the works and ideas of Andy Warhol, who becomes a primary influence for pop art in China. The underlying logic upon which pop art in the West and in China rests is different. Western pop art derives from commercial culture, while Chinese pop art derives from mass revolutionary culture. As artists seek to demarcate and critique the ideological forms weighing upon their intellectual and artistic communities, engaging new perceptions and reinterpretations of the past begin to arise. The works of Wang Guangyi seek to deconstruct the normative and teleological narratives encountered within the dialectic interplay between state-sponsored transnational capitalism and Marxist-Leninist communism. It would seem pertinent here to elaborate on Althusser's conception of ideology and ideological state apparatuses, which helps to facilitate an understanding of the tendency of ideological forms to produce 
or interpolate subjects attuned to the rhetoric of the ruling ideology. Althusser distinguishes between repressive state apparatuses which function in and through violence and ideological state apparatuses which function through ideology, which is the main focus of Guang Yi's critique. This Marxist critique of the production of the individual subject under the guise of the ruling ideology serves as means to reflect upon the historicized nature of aesthetic practice within contemporary China, as subjects of the prevailing ideological trends of the reform era attempt to critique and represent contemporaneous social shifts. Guang Yi attempts a visual rereading of the political and ideological rhetoric upon which this newfound engagement with modernity was based. During the Cultural Revolution, a total of 2.2 billion portraits of Mao are produced. In Wang Guangyi's Mao Zedong Red Grid No. 2, the artist utilizes one of these standard portraits of Chairman Mao that was epitomized the era of the artist's youth. It shows a deadpan black and white rendition of Mao based on a photograph that makes him look uncannily young. Superimposed over the photograph is the Grid of Red, which is a famous motif known as Guangyi's Grid of Rationality. The multi-presence of such an iconic political image and a structure used for scaling and reproduction exposes the mechanized manufacture process of propaganda. The artist distances the viewer from the hold of Mao's image over the self, over the psyche, by placing a red printer's grid over the photograph. That grid is exactly how the image of Mao had been reproduced millions of times. It becomes non-traversable barrier between the chairman and his audience forcing an objective reconsideration of the specimen under the microscope, a sense reinforced by a dynamic red. By inserting it, the artist says that this power was constructed, and there was a myth-making machine behind the power that Mao had grown to hold over the people. On one level, the red grid suggests imprisonment, while on another, a chain of red squares makes the image of Mao seem further from the viewer. By evoking China's most ubiquitous image, a national icon behind the red grid, Guangqi seeks to establish as irrational the uncritical deification of the great leader through a critical de-deification of his image on canvas in a bid to move beyond the historical moments of Mao's ideology. Through his dissection of the great leader, Guangqi attempts to remove the emotional connection to the image of Mao with Red Grid. It forms the literal framework for a rational analysis of the picture plane. It also unthinkably implies Mao's imprisonment, or at the very least, an insurmountable barrier between his revered image and the gaze of the worshipful masses. Today, Mao Zedong Red Grid No. 2 remains as much of a tour de force as when it was first exhibited. It is not with irony that the image Mao behind bars should serve as a proverbial key that conceptually opened not one, but an entire myriad of doors for avant-garde Chinese art in the 21st century. People's conscious experience of the world and sense of individual personhood is always bound up in the effects of the socio-political events that happen around them. Through chromatic perception, emotions, aggressions, and immediacies of art create a visual power that connects to the passions of the viewer. Being the color that elicits the strongest reactions, red has always been intertwined with politics. It serves its given purpose and is influenced and shaped by different social conditions and circumstances. In Althusser's terms, Red becomes an ideological instrument to perform a ubiquitous social function to transform and equip people to respond to their conditions of existence. It presents itself as a sign, an object, or concrete image that provokes an idea, a notion, or a feeling. Transcending the borders of history and time, political red has been a capable and compelling tool to unite people to support a cause, and with it, artists find a meaning to construct an identity to bring new theorizations of the individual's experience. In Zen they say, if something is boring after two minutes, try it for four. If still boring, try it for eight, sixteen, thirty-two, and so on. Eventually one discovers that it's not boring at all, but very interesting. John Cage What is it to be bored? To experience boredom? What makes something boring? How can boredom be used in art to further ideas? This thesis will investigate the connections between boredom, queerness, and anti-capitalism, and how queer performance exists as a synthesis of all three, challenging one's perception of art and life, and how interconnected everything is when given the time to exist. 
Using Jonathan de Katz's writings on boredom and queerness and identification, Guy Debord's theories and writings for the situation is international, and Judith Halberstam's queer writing, I will apply previous analyzations of boredom in art and film to contemporary performances and bring in anti-capitalist theory, connecting boredom and queerness in how capitalist production modes can be strategically thwarted by these positions through the use of small resistances to the dominant order. Then, looking at how boredom was commodified within our capitalist society, I will investigate the work of earlier queer performance and film work by artists like Andy Warhol, and then into contemporary artist Puppies Puppies, or Jade Kariki Olivo, and how they are creating work that is queer, anti-capitalist, and boring, in order to challenge the concept of art in the 21st century. I will question how these artists make a living while creating this work, and if there can be a separation between the work and commodifying it in order to live, and the contradictions within that, and how boredom can exist in contemporary times. As a symptom of and reaction to, boredom was created with modernity and industrialization of the 19th century. Before then, the term boredom did not exist. There was malaise, melancholy, and the like which represent their own respective eras, but boredom is specifically modern in how we experience it within contemporary society. As industrialization sped up production and our perception and expectation of time itself, our experience of time while doing nothing seems without meaning, a black hole of nothingness. Within that black hole, however, exists a will to examine oneself, to ask why one is experiencing the feeling of boredom. Boredom itself is not boring. It is what one chooses to do with their boredom that determines how it is experienced. For many artists, boredom is integral to their process, allowing time for ideas to form and take shape. Thorin Klosowski says that being bored, procrastinating, and embracing distraction all help your brain function. In turn, you understand decisions better. You learn easier. Benedict Carey explains that over time, boredom becomes a tool for sorting information, an increasingly sensitive spam filter, and that falling into a numb trance allows the brain to recast the outside world in ways that can be productive and creative. So as this rise in boredom took over during the mid-19th century, so too did the subject of boredom within art, as artists explored the experience of boredom within their works representing a modern experience to canonize. Paintings in the mid-19th century begin to resemble a quotidian narrative of mundanity and boredom within life. We see in paintings such as A Burial at Ornans by Gustave Corbet, 1849-50, with a depiction of a gravesite featuring commoners looking around throughout the field of the canvas, with the two children at center left with looks of boredom on their faces, no doubt wondering when they can leave and what the meaning of this ceremony is. Or with The Cradle, by Berth Morissette, 1872, depicting a woman staring blankly into a cradle containing an infant sleeping. We see in these works, and among many others during this period, an interest by the artist in the boring, the unfascinating moments of life that are usually repressed, now the entire subject matter. Boredom, however, is only represented in these paintings, as they are still beautifully done objects for one to gaze at, whereas an experience of boredom, purposely for the viewer, is created later by artists like those within the Dada movement, with excursions, performances, and the presentation of ready-made objects, Dada has challenged the endurance of the viewer with their pieces. As experienced in the visit to saint julien la prairie organized by André Breton on April 14, 1921, as part of a Dadaist excursion, participants were brought into an abandoned, insignificant church in the middle of Paris as to combat the touristification of the city, and were confronted with the limits of modern life and, more importantly, the creative threshold of modern subjectivity, or, in different terms, were subjected to an experience of boredom and then expected to make of it an excuse to think beyond the nothingness of that space, in turn saying yes to boredom and allowing for oneself to be open to mental creativity. As Breton himself put it, Dada is boring only in relation to one's expectation of it, putting the blame on the viewer for not recognizing what to do with the boredom. 
Another Dadaist famous for boring works is Marcel Duchamp, who popularized the ready-made object. For his piece Bottle Rack, 1914, he selected a mass-produced drying rack for soda bottles, signed it, and called it art. Seemingly simple, these ready-made pieces act more as an invitation to question than to answer. Julian Jason Holliden describes Bottle Rack and Duchamp's work in general as such that the actual object is merely a placeholder for our affects, a purposive experiential lack or black hole of meaninglessness into which we, the spectators, look endlessly. This way of thinking about an art piece is meant to then be relayed into the viewer's life, to question the purpose of every object they own or encounter, to see it in a possibility to hold meaning or to act as a void in which they create their own. Later on we see, as concluded by Jonathan D. Katz in Identification 1998, in talking about John Cage and Robert Rauschenberg, that in order for these artists to exist and make work as gay individuals, they adopted a performance of silence that made possible a queer opposition to the machismo-ness of abstract expressionism during the time of the Cold War, where otherness was persecuted. The silent, boring works included Cage's 433 from 1952, a composed piece of nothing for 4 minutes and 33 seconds, and Rauschenberg's White Paintings from 1951, both of which chose silence as a means of refusal and made a statement of non-statement. The silence acted as a camouflage to obscure its investments, providing them with the opportunity to essentially hide in plain sight and make oppositional work without actually being in opposition to anything that was known by the public. By adopting the silence and indifference within their works, so as to not be confrontational to McCarthyism, Cage and Rauschenberg tied their queerness to the aesthetics of boredom, creating a way of resistance to heteronormative capitalist society. However, as put by Mara Roth in The Aesthetic of Indifference, this zen-like approach to making art through chance may have been useful and exciting for these artists, but they also exhibited an extreme passivity, a decision not to assert, but rather to let happen what may. Twelve years later, Andy Warhol's Empire, 1964, consisting of an eight-hour-long runtime, statically showing the Empire State Building from evening until 3 a.m., comes out of the factory, Warhol's New York City studio. Warhol's films, known for their adherence of structuralism, which showcases the cinematic apparatus rather than creating a narrative for an audience to follow, engage viewers in a project of endurance that, quite literally, tests the limits of one's ability to be a viewer. Juan A. Suarez focuses on the use of amphetamine by Warhol and members of the factory, as well as the general public during this time, in the essay, Warhol's 1960s Films, Amphetamine, and Queer Materiality, stating that much of what went on at the factory, artistically or other otherwise, had some connection with the drug. In discussing Parker Tyler's distinction between drag time and drug time for Warhol, drag time being a time of boredom and uneventful contemplation, and drug time being time spent on drugs with a heightened perception, Suarez says, I would propose that it is not the commonplace that called for the redemptive lift of the drug, but the drug that made the commonplace quite uncommon, and let Warhol and his collaborators a heightened receptivity towards the, that excruciating everydayness that this critic casts in temporal drag time, because of the absorbent duration of Warhol's films. In other words, because Warhol was high on speed, what would be considered mundane was instead extremely heightened and became the center of attention. Empire then, when viewed on amphetamines in a drug time, would receive an attentiveness from a viewer for every flicker or slight movement or sound throughout the duration. This then brings to question, is one supposed to be high to enjoy this? Or does Empire create the perfect scenario for one to be bored, to think deeply about what is happening in front of them, to experience time outside of a heteronormative structure where one is not expected to do anything besides be there? In the essay Girl Interrupted, The Queer Time of Warhol's Cinema by Home King, the queering of time is achieved through temporal forms that are non-teleological and non-purposeful, and that critique the normative timetables of heritage, kinship, and reproduction, as well as the standardized clock time of labor and leisure. 
King goes on and quotes Judith Halberstam as saying, The experience of duration makes visible the formlessness of time, and then adding that, that formlessness is opposed to the rigid timetables, laboring hours, schedules for marriage and childbearing, and the generational time that links families to nationalistic discourses of history and progress. King continues by saying that those timetables are naturalized, biologized, and enforced by legal, economic, and social pressures and incentives from the state, and that deviations from such timetables are pathologized as signs of depression and the like, which reveals their ideological construction and speaks to the profound anxiety and perceived threat to the social order that arises when individuals fail to keep on the prescribed schedule. When viewed this way, Empire, with its eight-hour long runtime, taking up the same amount of time as a full workday, resists all societal structure and undoes the temporal logic of capitalist growth by emphasizing duration over instantaneous rewards and profit. Small acts of resistance and failures to a dominant order are described in The Queer Art of Failure by Halberstam as being weapons of the weak, a term used by James C. Scott to describe peasant resistance in Southeast Asia. Halberstam continues, The concept of weapons of the weak can be used to recategorize what looks like inaction, passivity, and lack of resistance in terms of the practice of stalling the business of the dominant. We can also recognize failure as a way of refusing to acquaintance to dominant logics of power and discipline and as a form of critique. As a practice, failure recognizes that alternatives are embedded already in the dominant, and that failure is never total or consistent. Indeed, failure can exploit the unpredictability of ideology and its indeterminate qualities. In applying to art, boredom can be seen as a weapon where artists can use what little power they have to refuse conforming to the dominant structure of the art market, instead creating works based in time, thought, and endurance, as seen in Cage and Rauschenberg's pieces. In Empire, this weaponized boredom seems to act in a more Duchampian way, where Warhol was not necessarily hiding at the time for being queer, as were his predecessors, and while still making work in prints and paintings to be sold, Empire exists as an experiment of resistance to capitalism, and therefore heteronormativity. The film exploits the iconic Empire State Building, and its inherent connotations of capitalism and wealth, dragging them on into the night with the graininess of the camera, forcing a viewer to confront the spectacle of the building for hours that could be used for literally anything else. Connecting this work to the commodifiable works of Warhol is not difficult, for one could stare the eight hours at a Coke bottle painting done around the same time and feel a similar sense of boredom and self-discovery. Empire takes that endurance level into its own hands and allows for the queering of time to take place for the viewer. The connection of uncommodifiable art pieces and commodifiable art pieces seems to exist in a circle where an artist creates work to critique and resist the art market and then commodifies it somehow in order to make a living. The previously mentioned artists are all culpable of this, not that they necessarily want to be, but because of how capitalism thrusts this onto them. It is also worth noting here that all the previously mentioned artists were white men. Boredom is a universal experience, however, not just for those with privilege. Jade Kariki Olivo, under the moniker Puppies Puppies, performed a liberty in 2017 as part of the Whitney Biennial. Olivo identifies themselves as a trans-feminine, gender non-conforming, two-spirit person of indigenous Puerto Rican and Japanese heritage. Here, dressing themselves in a cheap Statue of Liberty costume and standing on the roof of the Whitney in the frigid temperatures of March for the duration of the show, Olivo endures the elements and asks that the viewer endure the same. Here we see the costume artist contrasted to the backdrop of the city, with the Empire State Building sticking out. Liberty is about enduring. The weather, the requirements of the performance the artist placed on themselves, the duration of the show, and the inevitable boredom that comes from that. The piece, when experienced by a viewer, lasts for however long they are willing to stand out there to watch. While nothing happens in the performance by the artist, the piece gives the viewer the opportunity to gaze at nothing and be bored. 
but also puts on full display the spectacle of New York City, similarly to Empire, but here includes this camp representation of the Statue of Liberty, not only queering time with the duration and meaninglessness, but queering the icon that represents freedom in America, this freedom contemporarily being the freedom of markets and the capitalist American dream. Liberty, now, can be viewed almost as a celebration or embodiment of the flaneur, who is, as Halladin describes, a figure who resists the emerging commodity culture of the early 19th century by cynically embracing the almost extreme values of consumer capitalism, namely a hyper-real embodiment of the need for novelty and newness of a desire to be the spectacle. Where Olivo turns themselves into that spectacle for the viewer, the viewer is now placed in the position of having to discern the meaning of their spectatorship of a corporal spectacle placed within another spectacle, one that is the modern city. This complex arrangement of spectacles and spectators could also be thought of as a force de rive for the viewer, where they ascend to the roof of the building to simply look around, not just at puppies puppies standing there, but at the environment that contains them. Holliden describes a derive as an active critique of commodity culture because it goes against the explicit purpose of tourism and shopping, instead producing nothing from the experience except for the goal of being at play. Playfulness here is being offered to the viewer by escaping the confines of the museum to see a person standing in a ready-made costume on a roof with no explicit goals other than to be gazed at. Puppies Puppies also contradicts the purpose of the derive here by offering a selection of the touristy, foam, Lady Liberty Crown's founder on the city, now in the museum's gift shop as part of the piece, commodifying this experience. While Liberty may seem like a simple performance to an unsuspecting viewer, the piece offers a reflection and a commentary of existing as a queer artist in the 21st century. Choosing to be silent and hidden behind a mask, draping the Statue of Liberty's gown over their trans body, enduring the weather and the duration of the show, putting themselves on full display, commodifying the piece for the museum to sell. What is freedom in the art market, in capitalism? What is it to resist commodification, to resist heteronormative time structures? What is it to purposely contradict things in the name of art? What is it to be a queer artist working in this century, being anti-capitalist? What is it to ask all these questions and provide no clear answers? The history of queer art is inextricably tied to the history of boredom, to the history of anti-capitalism, a resistance to dominant structures and a constant questioning to the powers that be. Queer durational art challenges what art can be and do in a society based on production, spectacle, and commodity. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to the question and answer session for When Words Meet Images, our 15th annual Art History and Visual Culture Symposium. Like me, I'm sure you just enjoyed all of those scintillating, super smart papers. We're really proud of our students. And now we have the opportunity to pose a few questions to them. So if you'd like, you can go ahead and pop your question into the YouTube chat. I'll see it and be able to pose it to the students as they come out on together in their individual sessions. We'll have three sections of questions. So we'll start with session number one, where we were considering the questions of authenticity and exhibitions. So I'd like to welcome at this point, Angeline Leonard and Jean um, Cuisant to join us so that we can ask them a few questions. Afterwards, uh, we'll move on then to section number two and then section number three. And then finally, we will have an opportunity to just simply congratulate them all. We will also be toasting our students again at five o'clock through the art and art history uh, design and design department's annual festivities where we will award the Hollis Siegler a prize for manifest. And for the art historians, they get a piece of antiquated uh, obsolete technology, a slide carousel, as well as a stipend of $500. So
So again, um, this was such an honor and a privilege to work with the students throughout the semester. And in addition to writing the brilliant papers and theses that you saw, they also contributed significantly uh, to the creation of our BFA catalog, which we produce here every year at Columbia. So mad props to all involved. So without further ado, let me go ahead and pose some questions here. I'm going to be mindful of our time. Uh, so we have about five minutes per student if it works out one way or the other. And the first question I have is actually for Angeline. I so enjoyed your paper, Angeline. It's been amazing to see the progress and all the different directions you took us in considering the questions around reproduction. One of the key uh, questions that came in to us though is that you know, when you were posing questions about the church, people were thinking about other public monuments that have been lost or that potentially could be restored. And um, the questioner wanted to ask you about that. Like in your research, did you consider other examples of destroyed public work um, that has been or could partially be restored? And what impact might that restoration have on our understanding of the original work of art and its history? Right, okay. Thank you for that question. So, as some of you know that I wrote about the Buddhas of Bamiyan in my paper as well as the Fryan Kirsha. Buddhas of Bamiyan were created in the fifth or sixth century, somewhere around there. They're located, well, they were located in Afghanistan along a pivotal stop in the Silk Road. They were actually once the tallest Buddha statues in the world, but unfortunately the Taliban destroyed them in 2001 and Actually, in 2003, they were deemed a World Heritage Site in danger. Ironically, a couple years after their destruction, so a little late on that one. <laughs> but just like the Frank Kirsha, there's extensive work done on them, on all the fragments that were remaining of the bombed remains. They did work on the the inside of the statues, the niches that the statues were held in, and all the cave networking. Um, but now they have a question of, now that we've done all this extensive research, are we gonna reconstruct or not? And what will that look like for the future? And why should we not choose to reconstruct? So there are a few things to consider here. The first is there are no blueprints like the Frying Kirsha. These statues are incredibly old. I mean, they're from the fifth or sixth centuries. They, the only thing they have left to them is imagery. So is that reconstruction? going to be 100% accurate based completely on imagery? And if not, can you then call it a reproduction? Because if it's not a reproduction, then it's in its own entity on its own. And those old statues cannot relate to the new ones. Second, no one knows if the Taliban will target the reconstruction. And that means then that you wasted potentially millions of dollars on this project that the Taliban will see as a direct attack against their ideological ideas and the Western hemisphere because the initial attack was against the West. Third, you have to consider historical context of the Buddhas um, and the bombings. Um, they, I mean, again, they were attack on the Western world. So if you reconstruct, are you completely wiping away the historical context of their destruction and what that meant and what the empty niches mean to the world. And especially when you take into consideration um, religious conflicts in the world today and the fact that the Western world is still has problems with Afghanistan. And fourth, we lose ritual and religious significance. The Buddhas were initially created as a way that when people walked on the Silk Road, they came across these statues and maybe if they weren't Buddhist, they were exposed to Buddhism. And for the people who were Buddhist, they were allowed to practice their rituals on the statues. So our purpose for those statues do not match those from over a thousand years ago. And Again, how do we combat that? Because we're gonna rebuild for sentimental reasons. We're, we're rebuilding because here's a statue of cultural significance that was destroyed. And rightfully so, most people are like, no, well, I want it back. But, um, but we need to wonder if replacing them 
is worth the religious and historical value and accuracy that may be lost. Thank you for your really thoughtful response. And you really bring out all the complexities in the weight and consideration of these acts. There's another question that came in, um, specifically kind of continuing this very um, same discourse, but what about the restoration and rebuilding of Notre Dame, especially about the spire that's not gonna be original to the cathedral? I actually, I, haven't so I have not read a lot about that but if you're talking about the fact that the Notre Dame was unfortunately caught on fire and a lot of it was destroyed I think that situation matches what's happening with the Buddhas and what's happening with the Frying Kirsha and again the historical context and I say with the Frying Kirsha that there's a problem with the materials. There's a problem with, well, you're not gonna have the same materials that were originally built with it. And I come from a field, I come from the conservation perspective and original materials are extremely, extremely important. And we talk a lot about the ethics in conservation and the fact that you cannot replace original material with the new ones and expect them to have the same religious or historical context or significance because they weren't used for that original attention. So I think materiality will probably play a big part in the rebuilding of Notre Dame. That's really fascinating. Thank you for bringing those points to us. I think we'll shift gears now and we've got a question that's come in for Sean. Um, fascinating case studies that you brought us through. And they're really an example of how contemporary art practices can be more responsive and can be site specific. And do you see this practice continuing to expand as we move forward? Oh, uh, well, yes, uh, because the first papers of surrealism and uh, Tui Transfiguration are not alone. They are representation of a phenomenon with a certain scale that has been happening in the field of exhibiting. Um, the avant-gardeism concept of exhibition never ceased to develop after Marcel Duchamp, and Wu Hong's experimental practice is only a part of the progress in Chinese site-specific exhibition experiment. An example that could be considered as an outstanding successor of Duchamp's method of exhibiting is Hong and Cadrol, created by the Swedish curator Pontus Houghton at the entry hall of the Moderna Mossad in the summer of 1966, in which a participative environment was created in the form of a gigantic pregnant woman. And for Chinese experimental exhibition, Wu Hong conducted a research project in which he summarized the development of experimental art exhibition in China. The research also includes a documentary history of 12 experimental exhibitions in China. Therefore, it is a previous developing and an ongoing tendency of the development of art exhibition as a form of art. Great, I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to happen next. There's another question here, and I'm not so familiar with the name, so please forgive me if I mispronounce this. But the question is, um, is uh, Rangun's name in some way related to the one issue of Rang One, published by Duchamp and Henri Roche and Beatrice Ford in New York in 1917? Well, I won't say there's like a obvious or direct relationship between them because uh, Rong Rong is uh, the artist name uh, he came up with, but his original name is Lu Zhirong. So he to actually took the last character of his original name and yeah. <laughs> It seemed like there was a potential surrealist play or data is act in that. Um, but again, translation. Yeah, that's can be... a interesting thought though. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely, for sure. I have another question too. Um, and, you know, here related to the earlier one though, since contemporary art exhibition is seemingly more creative or the potential of engaging, um, do you think in the future the white cube mode will be eliminated in exhibition design? 
Uh, well, I think the Y cube will still remain as an independent, uh, important method of discipline in artworks because the artworks are still the audience's only interest in many situations. And for them, the Y cube will be the most suitable exhibiting setting. And however, I believe that the influence of contemporary art exhibition will strengthen. So in the future, when talking about art exhibition, people think about it not only as a tool for discipline, like those in traditional museums, but also as a way of artistic expression. I really appreciate that. And even in my own uh, brief study and work in museums, practices have changed so radically, moving from the kind of anonymous presence of the curator into actually crediting them, as well as the exhibition design staff, the registrar, just really the museum being more critical and aware of its um, presence and engagement with the audience. So thank you for giving us so much to thought, think about um, in your exhibition. So at this point, I think we'll shift over to our next session. So we will say for the moment, goodbye to Angeline and Zhang, and please ask Sam Collins and Jenna Karecki to join us for questions that are related to their session, which was, as you know, really focused on the ideas of genre, um, um, in terms of horror films, abject art, and gender. So let's go ahead and start first with Sam. And at this point, Zhang, I'll ask you to go ahead and turn off your video. Great, now we're all set here. So thank you um, again. I was so excited that you got the opportunity to interview um, Jennifer Reeder, Sam. That was one of the things we had hoped for when you were uh, working on your paper. And um, I was curious if you could elaborate more about what you talked about um, and what she said about your work with the thesis um, and how it relates to the film, and then also uh, your critical take on the tropes. Yes. Um, so one thing that I didn't get to include in the presentation was that Jennifer Reeder described Knives and Skin as an ode to horror films. So um, she would set up each scene in a very traditional way, but then subvert the viewer's expectations by the end. Um, in one scene in particular, um, the beginning when Carolyn's mother is like investigating her room with the knife, that is a direct quote from Rosemary's Baby. Um, so I thought it was interesting that she references the genre all throughout the film, but then also makes distinct changes. No, I agree. That's really fascinating. Um, and it's really interesting, again, to try to contextualize your work within the, this broader genre, but then also to force the changes that she brings into our thinking. Um, I was just wondering, you know, were there other uh, films that you felt that could be used as a case study uh, for your thesis? And, and how did you end up choosing the ones that you did? Yeah, so I actually talked about or wrote about A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, which is directed by Anna Lily Amirpour. And it was released in 2014, and it follows a nameless skateboarding vampire as she preys on the abusive men of her city. Um, and I talk or wrote a lot about Barbara Creed's uh, analysis of the vampire, as well as how. Um, there's not much dialogue in the film, so camera angles really showcase who has power in different scenes. Um, as far as I picked movies, that ki kind of came pretty naturally. Ginger Snaps is one of my favorite movies, so I kind of had a bias there. Um, but the idea of the thesis kind of sparked over um, having so much time to watch movies in the past year. Um, I started going back to a lot of classics that I hadn't seen. Um, slashers mainly. Um, and I've always been a horror fan, but you know, everything's entertaining, but there's room for critique. Um, so it was really interesting to dive into a lot of the theory um, into something that I was like a hobby of mine as well. So. That's excellent. Thank you so much. I love the vampire films uh, genre myself. And it is really interesting to see how you were able to interweave these different complexities um, and again give us really strong visual analysis and presence so thank you so much for that much uh, to think about and on um, at this point i would like to shift over and ask jenna um, a couple questions one of the ones that came through us 
questions on the chat is what motivated you to analyze the abject and how did that transition to the works of Latin American um, female artists? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think the thing that immediately draws me to the abject is that kind of base level compulsion and repulsion um, that is both fascinating and disturbing. Um, but after reading further about it, I became interested in the idea of subverting power structures without accidentally reinforcing them. Um, in doing further research, I found a lot of analysis on American artists in the 18 uh, or in the 1980s and 90s, um, specifically after Kristeva released Powers of Horror. Um, but I think it's interesting that it's been so limited because the feeling of abjection as that kind of visceral human response presupposes Kristeva's actual work. Um, so I don't think that the analysis should be limited to after the 1980s or to the United States. Um, there's a universal nature where we all experience that like corporeal self um, and even though socio-political impacts um, of the abject can change depending on context, the idea of bodily defilement is a constant. Um, it transcends barriers of time, place, and language. Um, I would also say that the documentation that uh, is used by the artists I discuss um, kind of fosters that transmission of the abject because it makes the experience more accessible. Um, and I don't know, while I think that um, it's really important not to define these artists like or categorize them like through Western white theorists, I also think it's important to like analyze the non-Eurocentric artists that I haven't seen anything about uh, without doing further research of my own. Um, and I also think that it's important to note that a lot of these came before Chris Davis, like theory was published and before the rise of um, abject art in the United States. So I definitely think that abjection is not exclusive to a certain type of person and it's most commonly associated artists don't define it. No, thank you so much for that. I am so appreciative of the ways that you expanded our canon um, as we're always trying to push and give thought to that here, certainly within our program. And then I also really appreciated too the fine line that you have to think of in performance between a subversion and perpetuation. You know, where is it, especially in regards to a lot of the goals of feminism? Um, this can be a really a challenge. So I, th I think you bring us through that really in a smart way. There's another question that came up for you, Jenna. Um, and the person notes that both of your artists use physical pain to indicate a kind of deeper socio-political message. Um, do these works make use of psychological pain? And if not, are there artists that you would include to address a further psychological pain? And does psychological pain have a place in the abject? That's a really good question. Um, I see the act <clears throat> of injuring oneself is innately psychological, um, having to go against that like survival instinct and the brain's aversion to pain. Um, and I also think that there is a meditation on the like socio-political issues that are being addressed with the acknowledgement and even empathy of the physical and mental pain of the victims. Um, but an artist I would say kind of exemplifies the psychological pain of the abject um, is Ana Mendieta, who I discuss in my full thesis. Um, in specific, her performance, um, Untitled Rape Scene, on which she recreated the aftermath of a fellow University of Iowa student's uh, rape and murder based on the police report. Um, she performed it once in her apartment for unsuspecting peers and teachers and um, another time in like the public on the University of Iowa campus. Um, in Mendieta's early work is concerned with the violence that she's both seen and experienced as a Cuban-American woman. 
Um, and while the scene in the blood suggests a very physical violence, Mendieta had to place herself in a terrifyingly vulnerable state. Um, she's really embodying violation, and I don't think that's really a feeling that immediately stops after its occurrence. Um, and as she kind of forces the audience to confront what happened, I think that it must have been a lot more painful to be, you know, standing still, exposed and vulnerable for hours with no distraction besides thinking about what happened. Um, but overall, I would say that physical abjection is always tied to mental abjection. Um, just as like the body and the self are intrinsically tied, I would say like the physical and the psychological are tied as well. Oh, well said. And again, another example of perpetuation versus subversion versus, versus again, a critical experience and, and thoughtfulness. So thank you for that, Jenna. Um, I have enjoyed reading the thesis as well. Um, we've got another question here, and this one actually comes from Deborah Parr. We have our colleagues uh, here in the house with us. And uh, Dr. Parr says, Sam, great research, Clover, Baldy, Butler, very strong trio to bring to bear on the questions that you raise. And I think about the work of Jordan Peele in his recent horror film as a way to think about race. And does this resonate with your idea that women have more of a stake in the genre than men? I think Jordan Peele is such an important person in horror right now. Um, definitely, I think people drawing from their own experiences is a great way to make a horror film. And um, yeah, definitely, I would say marginalized groups drawing from their own experiences um, creates a greater stake in horror because it's based in reality. Um, so in that way, <laughs> men do have a great stake in horror as well. No, it's interesting. Again, the key question is to think about not only the categorization of, of gender, but also the power dynamics there within. Yes. Um, and you both do that really in a very thoughtful, provocative way. So thank you so very much, Sam and Jenna, for fielding some questions. We've actually got a few more of them in the chat, but I think that we should probably move on to our next session. So I will please ask um, Oiku and also Aif to join me now for questions on our third session session, which looked at phenomena and states of being. So with that, lovely to see you both again. And we're going to start off with a question for Oiku um, in this case. So my first question is just kind of more broad in general. It's um, the perception of red has evolved, right? As you so eloquently lay out for us in such important events and experiences throughout history. How do you think that the color is being utilized politically in today's art world? Thank you for the great question. Um, the One of the most prominent examples of this is Donald Trump's presidential campaign and his presidency from 2017 to 2021. Because during his presidency, he was pushing back on the notion of a blue wave and embracing the idea of a red wave, even shouting it at his rallies. But the adaptation of red was a popular culture shift from the Cold War and the Cultural Revolution in China. And when uh, Trump returned to the politics in 2017, he did so as a Republican and embraced the color red with such gusto. And the Make America Great Again hats that symbolize his campaign came in various colors, but Trump seemed to be fond of the red one, which could be seen in his rally crowds as well. I mean, red is a primary color, it's striking and it's radiating in its strength, but it is hard to miss the historical oddity of a Republican president who so proudly waves the symbolic color of communism from both Soviet Union, where communism first came to power, and China, a country which he antagonized. Instead of associating red with communist ideology and Chairman Mao, Trump utilized the chrome as a symbol for patriotism and Americanism. Thank you for that 
very uh, succinct <laughs> historical presence. And yes, um, I am very aware of the use of the color in, in that respect. So thank you for bringing it to that. Um, the next question I have is actually coming from Professor Ozturk. Um, and he thanks you for a fascinating paper and he appreciates your careful study of the color from a, from a critical perspective. He has a question though about Warhol's race riot. Many versions of that piece that he's seen also included blue and just black and white images as well. And how would those then fit into your argument? And additionally, do you think that this is a time when Warhol gets quite fascinated with tragedy, traffic is accidents, for example, poisoning the execution series. Um, so he wondered if uh, Warhol's interest could have been less in social cause and more in populated, uh, popular circulated images, a transformation of his earlier um, obsession with celebrities. Thank you for the question again, Professor Mooney and Professor Ostert. Um, I actually get more into this in my thesis paper. Um, when you look at it in an overall picture, ideology performs a ubiquitous social function, one that must be fulfilled in every society, since in all people must be formed, transformed, and equipped to respond to their conditions of existence. And this is where color red specifically comes into play and show showcases its power. And in more detail, Andy Warhol's Red Race Riot is included in a series of artworks he titled Death and Disaster. And Death and Disaster series show images in one color, a reproduction of the same images or the same images with no color entirely, which Professor Owen also gets into uh, when he asked red, blue, and black and white. With the red, blue, and black and white one, the United States flag is among the nation's most recognized and used symbols. And Warhol uses the color red, white, and blue to depict on American flag, which ironically represents the freedoms and rights guaranteed in the United States Constitution, freedoms that were taken away from African Americans. And the black and white version of it, um, of the silk screen, brings this emphasis on colors black and white, and their use is a symbol of the racial divide and inequality that African Americans were facing. Um, and I, I agree with uh, Professor Ostrick when he said that Warhol also considers the popularity of circulated images besides just the social cause. Because in this series, Andy Warhol clearly brought out the motivating functions of art, art for propaganda, political change, communication, entertainment, and others. And at the same time, the work also brings out the non-motivational functions, including the rhythm and the balance of the piece, the instinct for harmony, the expression of imagination, the mysterious experience, symbolic universal communication, and ritualistic functions found in society. And he uses, sim he uses color as a symbol to depict all of these um, functions that were happening in the society at the time in the US in 1960s. Fascinating. So I have one other quick question for you, and then we're going to shift over to Eif. Um, this is actually from Professor Greg Foster Rice, who we're happy to have uh, with us here. And he said that he really enjoyed your presentation, and he'd be fascinated to hear your thoughts briefly um, about the use of the color red in commercial circumstances as well. And he gives Supreme as an example. I actually touched on this both the, on the paper and the presentation itself. Um, specifically, I will give an example, like I mentioned the Life magazines and how Life magazine used uh, the color red and how kind of Warhol clashes with the symbol symbolism of red by the way he uses the color. So it's more on um, blood and these riots and this fire that's happening within this the uh, function of the society, the system. And um, in commercial circumstances as well, um, red is, as I said, it's a very strong color. It's very um, um, attract. It's very attracting, and its um, function. It's in the series. Um, I, I'm sorry. I think something's wrong uh, with my connection. Could you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can hear you just fine. Oh, you you can hear me. Okay, um, well, um, I apologize. I think something is wrong with my, with my internet. Okay, I think that you gave us a really good, succinct uh, 
a point to that. And definitely we look forward to reading the rest in the thesis. At this point, how about we shift and pivot then and ask, I have a few questions. Um, there are a few that have come in. Um, specifically, I think people are really taken with Puppies Puppies performance um, at the Whitney Biennial and would like to know a little bit more about their practice and how they envision themselves engaging in this long um, kind of discourse around on we around the derive and around kind of opening us up to multiple um, experiences. Yeah, thank you. Um, so previously, they've done a lot of performances, um, like concealed, concealing their identity with masks, um, and like standing in spaces and galleries. Um, so there's one that I looked more in depth at that happened in 2019. Um, titled Anxiety, Depression, and Triggers at the Belles Hertling Gallery in Paris, um, where it was a performance where they were nude um, in the gallery, um, surrounded by fog. And they, um, during the duration of the show, they would go and paint the words anxiety and depression on canvases. Um, and then in another space, in the gallery, they had um, triggers of guns that were decommissioned off of old um, army pistols, um, like acting as a ready-made piece to look at. Um, and I thought the titles of the work that they chose were very interesting. Um, they titled the triggers as Trigger. Um, the fog was titled Brain Fog, Lexapro Withdrawal Side Effect. Um, they titled themselves as Naked Self Transitioning 19 Months on Hormone Replacement Therapy. And they titled the paintings um, Painting to Pay for My Healthcare. <laughs> um, so I thought it really like talked about like this commodifying of their work in order to support themselves, but also like as a queer person and like having to make work to support their transition. Um, and also the um, the use of triggers, like thinking of Duchamp and like those ready-made objects. Um, but when it's presented by this trans artist, it brings to mind like um, genitals and genitalia mm -hmm. and decommissioning of those appendages after transitioning. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. The, uh, there's a kind of humor and honesty in the tiling and then like was really thoughtful in regards to the connections made between object and experience. Um, we've got one last question for you, I before we're going to transition off screen, um, take a breather, and then uh, rejoin together as a department for the toast. And this actually comes uh, from Professor Ozturk. Um, again, really complimentary. All of the professors are really impressed with everybody's work. Um, and Professor Ozturk asks, um, it's been argued that Andy Warhol uh, did all of his kind of art, artwork to support the films. And you hinted on this perhaps too. Would you comment on this further? And do you think that his other work um, labeled as commercial, there could be an aspect of boredom as an aesthetic tool as well. And here he's thinking of the Sunset series originally developed as film could be an interesting case to explore further. Yeah, um, I'm not super familiar with um, the use of like the other art to create the films. Um, I didn't really look that much into that. Um, but I do think the aesthetic of boredom was um, used in like the sunset. Um, I did look into that sunset film and um, I remember reading that it was like uh, this constant failing attempt to capture a sunset for like the duration of the camera's reel. Um, yeah. No, I so appreciate that. And I think again, your cage quote um, just sits there so profoundly asking us again to consider and question our experiences. So thank you for your whole paper in, in that work and especially the way it then combines um, thinking further about ennui, the derive, um, and queerness and commodification. So we're ready to conclude our 
question and answer session, although there are many other things that come through on the chat, you'll be able to see this and through the live recording later as this is documented every year. Our seminar always starts by watching last year's participants um, and it's really exciting uh, for the students to kind of imagine um, them moving forward. I want to thank all of the students for their hard work and thoughtfulness um, in presenting um, and I look forward to toasting their efforts later uh, at five o'clock. Please join us. There is a link uh, for those of you in the audience um, included in the program right below in the YouTube that will take you there. Um, and there you will first hear our chair, Duncan McKenzie. Welcome everybody. And then uh, we'll have a couple prizes to give to a variety of students, both for our BA and our BFA degrees um, as well as our graduate students, of course. Um, I would like to take an opportunity to give special thanks uh, to Mimi Yu and the Media Center who support us so diligently, to my fellow colleagues and staff members um, who make this possible, and a special thanks to James Meyer who spray painted the golden carousel. Um, and also to remember the professors who are no longer teaching at Columbia College, but certainly contributed so much to the art history of game. That would include Dr. Kate Ezra and also Mr. Corey Postilio. They're with us in spirit. Take care. Bye-bye.